The following program is an MLWRadio.com production. Hey everybody, welcome to the MLW Event Center. I'm Sean Mooney and the countdown is on. MLW Never Say Never is almost here. See all the stars of Major League Wrestling December 7th in Orlando at Guilt Nightclub. John Morrison will debut as he teams with Shane Strickland against Darby Allen and Jimmy Havoc in a no-DQ match. Two former UFC fighters throw down as Matt Riddle looks to avenge his friend Jeff Cobb as he battles filthy Tom Lawler. Plus Joey Ryan versus MJF, Sammy Gravara versus Jason Cade, MVP versus Brody King and Santana Garrett versus Laurel Van Ness and so much more. And once again, Tony Schiavone will be in the house calling all the action. Get your tickets right now at MLWTickets.com. Meanwhile, over on the MLW Radio Network, Marty and Sarah Love Wrestling is back with behind-the-scenes action at AAW as well as Sarah's Old School Wrestling Corner. What buddies are on this week? You'll have to come by to find out. This week on the J.J. Dillon Show, J.J. and Rich wrap up their look at the Andersons and then dive into the origins of Kamala, the Ugandan giant, and J.J.'s role in helping make the big man a star in the Memphis Territory. What happened when... Jim Crockett presented his last Starcade. Find out as Tony Schiavone and Conrad Thompson look at the 1987 edition of Starcade out now. This week on Lucha Talk, Dylan, Alfredo, and Raul look at Angelica's AAA departure, CMLL running the same tournament twice in six months, and so much more. Be sure to tune in to Primetime with Sean Mooney. This week, a WWE legend tugboat, Fred Ottman, hits the podcast like a typhoon with his take on how he became a very large presence in the WWF. Don't you dare miss it. Fans, arguably the most critically acclaimed and commercially successful wrestling book in years, Jim Ross's autobiography, Slobberknocker, is on sale now at Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, and all major bookstore chains. The book has been a top bestseller categories for two months now. Slobberknocker is not only a book about wrestling, but a lifetime story of perseverance. The book is a great holiday gift. Get your copies now. And remember, MLW's big show is Thursday, December 7th with a stacked lineup. Don't miss out on this event. Get your tickets now at MLWTickets.com. And now it's time to get back to your favorite MLW radio podcast. Welcome to WHW Monday. Tony Schiavone and Conrad Thompson. Jim Crockett for Starcade, 605 NWA. TV title, Cajun Omni, the Bunkhouse Stampede. Flair and Horseman, Garvin, Bogey, Magnum, Dusty, Express Tag Team. Turner Bond and Mid-South Joy World Championship Wrestling. Talking about the great years of World Championship Wrestling, the NWA and Jim Crockett Promotions. Tony and Friends North, they win. Look, Shivani's back again. World title split off center stage. Bischoff, Disney, Hogan, and Nitro. New World Order and the Crow. Thunder Russo, Arquette Champ, Vinny Mac, simulcast. Tony's back with Conrad. Not your classy podcast. Watch a long try not to laugh. Lois rules cat back. This wasn't the initial plan. Tom Zig's a good looking man. Klondike Bill, make a tip. Tommy, you come over here. What happened when? WHW Monday. And now, let's go to the ring. And here's your co-host. Hey, hey. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to What Happened When? Monday, right here on the MLW Radio Network, and the man you're really here for, Tony Schiavone. What's going on, Tony? How are you? Hey, Conrad. How you doing? Happy holidays to you, and uh, for all the slap dicks out there, happy holidays to you. Conrad, uh, I was uh, uh, making my regular phone calls to uh, anyone who uh, gets a t-shirt from uh, LoisRules.com. And one of the uh, one of the gentlemen I talk with can't remember the name went to Starcade 2017 at the Greensboro Coliseum on Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving weekend I should say on the 20 25th and he said he was wearing his <clears throat> Conrad Thompson merchandise and uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said he was wearing one of our shirts and as he was walking to his seat out of the side he heard someone say. What happened when? <laughs> How great is that? How great is that? Uh, tremendous. So it's been a, tre- it was a tremendous month of November for us for t-shirt sales. We are homing in 
on getting this wedding paid for. That being said, we are we've had so much fun. Can you believe now? In another month, we've been doing this a year. It's pretty crazy. And during that time, we have uh, we've changed people's perception of Tony Schiavone. We have uh, innovated a little bit with a new permanent gimmick, the running commentary thing. And who better to do it with than you, who were there? Uh, it's been a great run, man. I've had a lot of fun with this, and I know that. You know, I'm a wrestling fan, obviously, first and foremost. We are tickled to have you back involved in wrestling, man. Thanks to you for setting all this up. I, I say that to to everybody I talk to. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, Bruce Pritchard for all his guidance and assistance. Uh, thanks to Court Bauer, MLW Radio. As a matter of fact, uh, the next event for MLW, as we are taping this, of course, uh, to air on the uh, 4th of December, uh, the next event for MLW Radio is uh, coming up on December 7th, and I'm getting ready to go down there and uh, with Rich Bikini uh, call another event for MLW uh, Never Say Never. Looking forward to that. Really looking forward to uh, seeing what you did. I was able to catch one shot on um, Internet Pay-Per-View, and I was really, really pleased with the production, and it was cool to see you do your thing again. I had lots of friends who listen to the show and are familiar with what we do, and they thought that your commentary on that show was one of the best wrestling commentary performances of the year. I mean, everybody grew up on your voice. They're very familiar with your voice. And to hear you calling wrestling again is pretty doggone fun. Well, well, that means a lot. And I, uh, you know, Rich basically was doing the play by play and I was kind of doing the analysis and I was trying to, uh, you know, trying to put the kids over and, and talk about my experiences of calling so many matches and, it seemed to work and I, I enjoyed working with rich. You know, we got a couple of, uh, UFC fighters going at it, Matt Riddle and Tom Lawler going at it, uh, coming up in the next event. I'm looking forward to that. I got the chance to meet Tom Lawler in our last event. He's really appreciative of pro wrestling. As I understand a lot of MMA and use, uh, UFC fighters are, and then they're going to have a, uh, a no disqualification tag team match, Shane Strickland and John Henning Hennigan against Darby Allen and Jimmy Havoc. Saw Darby Allen last time. He's spectacular. And of course, uh, Shane Strickland won the main event last time. So looking forward to all of that, seeing some of the friends that I've made and, uh, thanks to everybody out there and thanks for the kind words as well. Well, I'm excited to hear what you thought of, uh, Matt Riddle, because he's got lots of internet buzz going right now. A lot of people think he is going to be a superstar in the business. And, uh, that's the type of stuff you can expect from MLW. So if you haven't already, uh, go check out MLW tickets are on sale. Now you can pick it up, of course, at MLWradio.com. And if you can't make it down to the event, I'm sure it's going to be on iPay pay per view very soon. Uh, we should mention that, uh, we're on the heels of our new Thanksgiving tradition, Starcade 87. And, uh, in hindsight, I've got to tell you, Starcade 87 was so much better than survivor series 87. What was the feedback you got from our little Thanksgiving tradition last week? The, the most feedback I got w- was for some fans who had, you know, had loved us during the 90s and had not really seen Starcade 87. I got a lot of feedback about that Ric Flair-Ronnie Garvin match, about how physical it was and how demanding it was. Uh, one guy said to me, he said, man, they just beat the shit out of each other. I said, yes, they did. Uh, and that's what the most feedback I got from that show from, from fans watching it. And there's, there's a lot of fans that say, you know, uh, you know, I, I listen to you in my car and I don't get to really put up the WWE network and follow along with you. Uh, so maybe be a little bit more descriptive in your commentary. You know, we don't call all the holds and everything. We tell stories as it goes along. So I think you can enjoy it, whether you watch it with us or not. Well, that's the goal. Yeah. The goal is definitely not to just focus on calling matches. Now, of course, some ridiculousness here or there we're going to call. And you can imagine with what we're covering today, that's going to happen. So if you haven't already, fire up the WWE Network and uh, we're going to try to make you laugh and entertain you with uh, one of the most interesting Starcades and storylines of all time. It's Starcade 1990. And uh, I want to remind you that Tony and I are going to press play at the exact same time you do. So when I say press play, I mean, go ahead and fire up the file and then press play. Of course, a lot of times on the network, you've got to sit through the little commercial and then you've got to sit through the don't try this at home and the rating and all that. We're skipping all that. So you need to go ahead and get all that ready and the show actually ready to start. 
because we're not going to give you commentary over a commercial that may or may not be there. Hopefully that makes sense, but I've gotten a lot of tweets that I waited and pressed play when you did. You just skipped the commercial and then I was behind. Catch up. <laughs> we're going to the actual show. And you can um, always go to pause. You can always pause it right before the, the graphics fly in. Well, there you go. So I feel like, um, rather than giving you a countdown here, we should, we're really like a six man podcast here. We're the six man podcast champions. Uh, let's give the hot tag to the third member of our team. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Three, two, one. Play. Well, that's a close. I'll get to a hot tag with that lady. Thanks very much. And here we go. As you can see, the 1990 graphics are ready. I'd like to say here, Conrad, that this was the first Starcade for me in my return from the WWE. If you'll recall, this was a Jim Hurd slash Ole Anderson production. And of course, it's from the fabulous Kiel Auditorium in St. Louis, Missouri, a building that would later on be uh, torn down. And this came on the heels, I shouldn't say on the heels, but it came in the same year uh, where, and, and as you know, we're going to have a tournament coming up uh, uh, for Pat O'Connor uh, the same year that he passed away. What a tremendous building this is. The lighting here, this presents big time. I love the look and feel of Keel Auditorium here. And I love the look of Paul E. Dangerously. A uh, lot of hair. You can see the receding line is beginning already. Rather thin right now, but still the great gift of gab from him and, of course, JR. Now, the your broadcast team here, uh, JR and Paulie Dangerously, I'm going to be doing interviews along with Missy Hyde. So there's your broadcast team, and Gary Michael Capetta is in the ring as our ring announcer. Uh, we had great uh, great reaction from the fans. And, of course, let, let's if, if you remember the storylines heading to this show, there was a very involved and uh, I don't know if you want to call it a good storyline or not, but it was a storyline that we put a lot of effort in, and that was who is the Black Scorpion. And that's going to be the payoff of the main event and what we're teasing the entire time. Of course, the Black Scorpion has been tormenting Sting for weeks leading up to this show. And here, it's become clear that we're either going to have a new world champion in the Black Scorpion, which is someone from Sting's past. That's pretty much all we know. Or... The black scorpion is going to have to unmask and we're finally learn his identity. Now, uh, right here, we're recognizing what Gary Michael Capetta said is the greatest promoter of all time. Mr. Sam Mushnick. What interaction did you have with Sam over the years, Tony? I had none with Sam, uh, uh Sam really, uh, with St. Louis, they, they ran St. Louis if fans in the old days, they ran St. Louis more like an all-star car than they did a territory. Uh, but, uh, I had no relation to, I met Sam Munchnick for the first time that night. So I had no relationship with him at all. Even though I work obviously behind the scenes with the Crockett's he's thanking Ted Turner, um, Jim Hurd, um, uh, mm-hmm. Barnett. He's, he's thanking everybody for the invite here. And obviously he gets a good reaction from this St. Louis crowd because St. Louis right. and the Keel auditorium and Sam Munchnick were a big part of the NWA for a long, long time. Right. They were, uh, you, you talked about the history at the, at the Keel auditorium. Uh, it was when you were booked in St. Louis, you were a big star. And that's how both the guys and territories felt back then to be able to be booked in St. Louis or like a Madison square garden. It was one of the big deals in pro wrestling. And, uh, we, uh, we're also going to see, uh, this is, and, and I found out from watching the show. Uh, this is, uh, this is WCW clusterfuck at its best. Uh, they went ahead and started the national anthem right here and had Gary intro the national anthem as it was going on. Yeah. Pretty ridiculous, but we should <laughs> mention unbelievable. the timeline here is that we're smack dab in the middle of the Gulf war and right. there is a lot of patriotism and everybody is, you know, on the other channel, the WWF is about to have Sergeant slaughter turn his back on America and they right. debate a month later, whether or not they should burn the flag and instead decide to burn a Hulk Hogan t-shirt. Right. But patriotism here is a big part of the show. And you guys are uh, obviously trying to yeah. support the troops and all that. 
as much Americana under- as you can here. I understand that. And I understand us trying to support the troops, but if we're going to take this effort to support the troops, you would think that we would have some sort of communication. There were things like this back in 1990 that made me want to kill myself. That made me realize that why, why had I left the WWE? Because we are just, we're just a a walking train wreck. Uh, and you're going to hear if you, if you listen to the show, you're not going to hear it by, by being in on, on this podcast, but at the end of the show, uh, Jim Ross says, uh, and it made me laugh back then, and it rekindled my memory when I saw it earlier. Uh, he said, oh, there is a Sid Rule sign. Don't, don't they know that, that Lois rules? Uh, but Jim Ross said, I don't know how much is left in our pay-per-view, but I would really love to know, which was he was trailing the truck, would somebody communicate with us? Uh, communication with the truck was horrible. But uh, the good news is, uh, we're going to start with a very good match, I thought. Uh, and here is a pride of Huntsville, Alabama, next to Conrad Thompson, beautiful Bobby Eaton. Huge fan of Bobby, as we've talked about here on the show. One of the more underrated performers. And here we get to see him in a singles match. One of the things I enjoyed that you guys did with this show is showing the stats here. And uh, I thought this was kind of cool. And I thought it was sort of interesting the way they introduced him. They said formerly of Huntsville, Alabama, because here... He's being introduced as being from the dark side. Is this to right. make sure that the fans know he's a heel? Don't let the neon and blonde hair ruin. He's a heel. Well, I think it was also a, a kind of a nod to the Midnight Express because that's where they were always sure uh, introduced from. Uh, but but I understand uh, the uh, the stats. By the way, uh, those were uh, an idea of Jim Ross's, uh, and I always thought Jim liked to do things like that. And I thought, whoa, whoa, hey, good looking. What you got to cooking? Hey, there comes Tom Zink, the Z man. Boy, he, he was, uh, he had a great upper body, didn't he? Oh my gosh. And so it begins. So this is going to be <laughs> Bobby Eaton's very first singles match on pay-per-view, but he's, uh, he's got quite a challenge for himself here because Jr. points out that Z man is on a 35 bout winning streak here. And, uh, he also mm-hmm. makes mention and ladies, he's a bachelor. How excited were you yes. at that announcement? Well, uh, I thought it was very nice. I thought maybe that I could get to know Tom and, uh, Tom and I could go out on the town and who knows, uh, collar and elbow tie back to the corner. Also the 35 game winning streak and a former Mr. Minnesota. Uh, don't forget that Conrad, Mr. Minnesota. I don't think, uh, uh, you I don't know, think Bobby we, won we, Mr. We, Alabama. Do you think what's that? I don't think Bobby was ever in the running for Mr. Alabama. Do you think? No, I don't even, I don't even think he competed in Mr. Alabama to be, a, to be, was there ever a Mr. Alabama contest? There is these days, Nick Saban wins, but once upon yeah, a time, every year, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Gus Malzahn would win, uh, but he may be able to win Mr. Arkansas in a couple of months. Well, by the time uh, people Ar- are hearing this, he might actually be in Arkansas. In Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. Woo. See you later. Uh, okay. Full arm trail. Uh, you know, we make a lot of fun about Tom Zink or about me and Tom Zink, but uh, Tom was a very good performer. Would yeah, you agree? It's, it's funny you say that because Jim Cornette has been very critical of Tom over the years. who said that he was a mediocre, uh, performer that, uh, he was really just a, a good look. And I think he took exception to the fact that he made more, that Tom Zink earned more money than a more skilled performer than say a Bobby Eaton, like in the ring, right. Tom Zink is earning a far sight more than Bobby Eaton despite the fact that Bobby Eaton is one of the best wrestlers. And and I think most of that is just based on the marketability that maybe Bobby Eaton did have skills that pay the bills, so to speak. But Tom Zink is a guy who they felt like would look good on a poster. So when those WCW merchandise, uh, you know, things would be inside the magazine, you know, like the little three or four page spread, there's lots of Tom Zink merchandise. There's Tom Zink towels and hats and shirts, not a lot of Bobby Eaton stuff. No, but, and you know, that's the way the world back in 1990 and it's the way of the world right now, uh, basically now in, in sports entertainment, uh, they have the, uh, very nice looking people on television, right? And that's the way it is. And that's the way it's always been. So, yeah, I mean, but I, I thought, I thought Tom had a, a good fire about him. He had good facials, he had good reactions. He wasn't the greatest worker in the world, but I think he, he was good enough and uh, he got a great reaction from the fans. So yeah, I liked him. 
this isn't too terribly long after Stan Lane and Jim Cornette have gotten out of Dodge. Bobby Eaton stuck around. Do you think Bobby um, felt like a man sort of out here on his own in real life at this point? Because he had certainly been positioned to have Jim Cornette as a mouthpiece, and he didn't really have to talk. And with a, with a mouthpiece like Cornette, who would want to? And then you've got you know, he's normally camouflaged in tag matches. Whereas here, I'm not saying he's not a capable performer. Certainly he was, he did a great rating against Ric Flair that year, but as a singles wrestler, did you ever have a conversation with Bobby about how he felt about sticking around, even though corny and Stan were gone? I did not, but, but one thing I did know, he and Arn were very good friends. Uh, he and Arn were Southern guys, Southern boys. And, uh, he, Bobby thought that this is where he belonged. This was a very much Southern promotion, you know, based out of Atlanta. And he, I don't, he never really wanted to move to New York and work there and work all, you know, back then, I don't know if they still do it or not. You may know Conrad, uh, the boys who worked in New York had quite a healthy, uh, travel schedule. Uh, and not that, uh, we didn't, but nothing like what they had. Uh, and, uh, so I, I think Bobby was very happy with where he was. He was, he was never this, this guy. I always, I never thought Bobby was this very ambitious. I want to be the top star in the business type guy. I don't think he never had a big ego. He just liked to work. And therefore I don't think he had an ambition to go to New York or go to the WWE. Look at these great drop kicks and Bobby's selling it quite, quite well. And there Bobby is in the ropes. What do you think of uh, Z-Man's logo here on his trunks? It's kind of a Zorro type logo, don't you think? Z. I didn't think Z. you. I didn't think I was allowed to talk about Zorro on the show anymore. Really? Well, did do we do we have a, a cease and desist from somebody on no, that? No, no. You had just referenced when I made mention of there being like a Bizarro Zorro that you uh-huh. that you weren't really you didn't appreciate the uh, connotation. Wow, you're you're just like Lois. You remember everything I say. Well, you know, I just mentioned Zorro the Gay Blade, and and you weren't happy about it. And <laughs> okay. well, I know where you're going with that. I'm just, I'm talking about logos, not right. characters. Talk about logos here. So it's a Z. I understand. Anyway, Bobby, Bobby, great great working punches. Bobby could do a lot of great things, and he would make you look good. And and as we as we see as this match develops here, uh, Tom Zink's going to make Bobby look good. In this match, give everybody a time cue so they know where they should be in the file here. I'm at 12 06, 07, 08, 09. Is that about where you are? Same place? Yeah. And here we go outside. Oh, notice how Bobby turned that time to protect himself, knowing how to fall. Great job, though, taking that bump outside in. And Nick Patrick says, Get in the ring. Get in the ring. And here comes a Z-Man. Great maneuver over the top. Now you can't pin him out there, dumbass. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, that should here make I, me laugh. Here, I, here I'm putting Zink over and he tries to pin him on the, uh, on the entryway. What are we doing? We've talked about it a little bit here on the show before, but remind everybody, what do you remember about Cornette and Stan Lane having enough of WCW? Well, you, you know, Jim has always been... Uh, and I know this is well documented in his books well, in his book. And I've read part of it. He has always been, uh, a very outspoken about the business, but I think it came down to one person. When you say that Jim Cornette and Stan Lane had enough of WCW and it came down to a man that we're going to see in this, uh, in this pay-per-view a little bit later, Jim heard, uh, they thought, and, uh, Jim, uh, Cornette thought that Jim heard was just. Uh, had no clue about the business, was not a good person to work for, uh, was going to uh, ruin the business. And in many ways, he certainly started the ball rolling downhill that Eric was able to stop. But I think it comes down to Jim Hurd. Great bulldog out of the corner by Bobby, turns him over. And here comes Bobby up top. One of the things in this match that was very good, both of these guys were high flyers. It's going to come into play in the finish of this match. Bobby goes up. Balances himself. Tom got himself positioned nicely. Oh, the Alabama jam. Woo. And that should be it. She should be it. You can't imagine a move like that 
not being the finish. Right. Oh, here's what I love. J- JR on commentary here says something when it went like, this is going to change your social plans for later in the evening. <laughs> uh, that's one of the things that made him the great one. He was, I, I don't know what that move was about. Tom touching his toes that time, just getting excited, getting stretched out. Great drop. He was a good drop kicker. Tom was Tom is going to be making a mistake here in this match that will cost him the match. Uh, again, we go back to this WCW always wanted to start out with a, an exciting get, get you off your feet type, uh, match. I think uh, a lot of the fans were into this, but what we're going to see later on is that this tag team BS tournament that we had is going to drag us down. So here goes Bobby again, Alabama jam. Wasn't good enough. Tom comes up with a super kick just in time for Bobby. And now Tom will go up top and try to win the match. You ready? Look at the fans standing up, Conrad. Bill after walks across the bottom. Zink is up top, and Bobby moves out of the way. Oh, critical mistake. Bobby Eaton moving out of the way. Fans behind the announce team who are dressed to the nines, and there goes an inside cradle standing up to clap that one, two, three, and that's it. Bobby Eaton gets the win. How about that? I, I think that one uh, caught people by surprise. Especially when you push that. You know, Z-Man is on a 35 win streak and this is Bobby's first singles pay-per-view. You certainly lead everybody to believe that this is an opportunity to showcase Z-Man, but thankfully, uh, Huntsville gets the win. Here's the mistake again. He went off where was going off for a missile drop kick on the top. Bobby had rolled out of the way. Tom apparently hit the back of his head. I don't know if he really did or not, but that enables Bobby to go up. And go for the inside credo. As you can see, our uh, our replays are long. Get to the point here, guys, in the truck. In the, and, whoa, yikes, somebody. Who is this uh, handsome devil? I don't know, but you can see why Lois had five kids because of him. But now we're going to bring in one of the greats of all time from the St. Louis area. Here is Dick the Bruiser. First time meeting Dick the Bruiser. What's the rationale in booking Dick, the bruiser here in the main event? Of course, Dick, the bruiser is going to be our special guest referee inside of a cage. And obviously he's a big deal in the town, but not so much for those watching at home, right? No, it's not. But again, if you have uh, Sam Mushnick at the beginning, uh, and you talk about how famous the key, auditorium was, and you have a Pat O'Connor Memorial tournament. And, uh, we are also going to have, uh, uh, one of their announcers, I guess, uh, uh, Gary Giola is going to, uh, I'll do some ring announcing here as well. Uh, we are paying homage to St. Louis and how much it meant to pro wrestling, how much it meant to the NWA. And we're also doing what Jim heard wants because Jim heard was from St. Louis. You see, um, was the catering that night pizza hut? We didn't have, you know what? Uh, I'm not so sure we had an elaborate catering back then, but good question. Pizza hut makes it elaborate. Well, if it's stuffed crust, I guess. <laughs> so we should mention here, uh, they're bringing yeah. out the, uh, the tournament trophy and they're making yeah, a, a, a pretty cool presentation. It feels a little throwback to like the old Crockett cup here, right? Yeah, it, it does. Uh, uh, funny enough, as uh, you see Randy Anderson and, and Nick Patrick bring it out, uh, Gary Capetta in his, I don't know if they gave him this line to say the winner of this will be considered the tag team of the universe champions of the universe. (laughs) I feel like we've got to make that a t-shirt and check out this hairstyle here. She looks like she's right out of the movie splash. Um, (laughs) but flair was there. So she probably splashed something else. This is the parade of uh, parade of nations. I almost said champions, but that's what Alabama has. This is the parade of nations. And, uh, it's just a bunch of chicks holding flags and some scattered yeah. pyro. What do you yeah, think it, of this it, parade of nations? I, I, it, it, it brought down the show. I, I, of course now, yeah, we're quarterbacking here many, many years later. I know, but you know, uh, have the athletes br- bring out the flags, right? <laughs> Our neighbors to the South, the nation of Mexico. I don't know why, but <laughs> this whole thing just comes off. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. It comes off WCW to me. 
So real talk whole- here, whoever's booking this did it as an opportunity to get all these chicks on pay-per-view and try to do some hot tagging in the back. Right now, only Anderson was the booker here. So I don't think Ole Anderson was into that. Uh, but, uh, this, this, this whole thing smacked of a Jim Hurd promotion. It really did. And, and it goes back to this. If the boss wants something, all of us, yes, men will go, Oh yeah, great idea. That's good. Let's bring out these chicks and all this hairspray and have them bring the flags and let's really, uh, let's really shut our show down. But, <laughs> And then and I guess up. I was one of those, but it, I mean, it, it sucked. Okay. It really did. Don't get me wrong. If they would have started the pay-per-view with all these ladies ringside with the flags and then yeah. introducing the trophy and all that, that could have, I mean, I would have been into that. And I'm curious right. when you've got a tournament like this, doesn't it make more sense to open with one of those matches to give the competitors more time between the matches as opposed to squishing them all together? Yeah, sure. It does. But again, the idea was to start with something very hot. We also had a lot of matches on a, this call. A ton of matches. Some of them don't get very yeah. much time at all. We should mention right. a great line from Dick the Bruiser earlier when they talked about why he was selected to be uh, the special enforcer, the special referee here. It's because he says he never lost a cage match. Hmm. Well, maybe <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in this era, though, it's not like they could just throw it in their Google machine. So here we go. Uh, I need hmm. you to go ahead and describe this tag team for us. Uh, well, uh, this is our, uh, tag team. Uh, isn't this the forerunner to uh, public enemy? <laughs> well, I mean, it looks sort of like the forerunner to the truth commission that the WWF had <laughs> in 1997. Okay, I, I, I'm not familiar with the truth commission. Okay. Neither is anybody else. <laughs> They're the eighth uh, seed of the tournament. Uh, and, and mm. they're former soldiers in South Africa. Yeah. We've got, uh, right. go ahead and say their names for us. Uh, Colonel de Klerk and I, and I missed the, uh, I missed the graphic on the other end. I think it was Sergeant Kruger, Sergeant Kruger. Yes. Yeah, like Kruger Rand and Colonel de Klerk. Uh, but am I right? Is this, uh, one of the members of public enemy before he was a member of public enemy? Oh, do you think so? Yeah, yeah, sure exactly look right. yeah. It's Rocco Rock. Hey, good for yeah, you. Rock. Colonel De Clerk yeah. here is uh, Rocco Rock. Ted Petty. Absolutely, it is. Me? I, I recognize that coming out. And here are the Steiners and all their glory. This was the glory days. I thought of the Steiners. Uh, bumping no tough. Uh, we had, uh, you know, we are just uh, after the first of the year. We're going to be going to. Uh, if you have that poster, I need you to DM me. If you've got that Steiner brothers poster with the yellow background and like the black splashes with the guys wearing their jackets and the dog, I want that. I had it as a kid and I'd like it again. Slide. You my had DMs. that as a kid. I did. And I loved it. I'd love to find another one. Wow. We should mention, I'm glad that you made me look that up because I kind of forgot because these guys are in and out here, but the Steiner brothers are not in here with two J Brones. One is Rocco rock. And the other is Matt Osborne who went on to be doink the clown. So one half right. of public enemy. Well, in the other half is big Josh slash doink the clown. It's pretty incredible when you think about the amount of talent that you guys have here in 1990, because both of those guys went on to have success outside of being South African soldiers. Well, uh, they were just put in this tournament as a gimmick here, obviously. Well, ob- uh, yeah. And you know what, at the time, you know, and, and it obviously didn't age well, but like a lot of ninja movies and ninja movies were really popular, which is kind of the whole basis behind the black scorpion. It's like this crazy, mysterious direct to videotape Kung Fu movie. Well, these right. guys, this gimmick here is right out of that. Like this is like the foot clan for the big boss or something. And it makes total sense that. WCW would lean on it, but it is sort of interesting that Doink the Clown is in there with Rick Steiner right now, and he's going to get demolished. Yes, he is, but he's going to make take some pretty good bumps. We already saw the great clothesline from Rick Steiner, and now there is the clerk, and oh, look at that. The fans always react to that because that thing was stiff. The double Steiner line. And a pickup and a slam. Which one was Kruger and which one was De Klerk? Uh De Klerk is uh, uh is the, the, the thinner of the two. He's going over the top I, right there. Yeah, I was interested about this spot. 
did they fuck this spot up or what happened? He went over the top and he grabbed me. I, I think Steiner is saying right now, he's got his head down. He's saying, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that I screwed that spot up because Sp Steiner was supposed to take a bump there. Steiner just caught him and he hit the back of his head on the ring mats or the outside mats. It's interesting in hindsight, just how over the Steiners are. And I love watching this era of the Steiner brothers, 89, 90, yeah. 91, 92. That's my favorite version of the Steiners. And man, how over was Scott Steiner there? Everything he does is a dynamic move that pops the crowd. Looks good. He's, uh, he works stiff. Look at that. Frankensteiner. You talking about side. Look, they made a one count right there, two and three. And, and we'll go back and take a look at this replay. I don't know. I'm not so sure who the referee was right there. Uh, that may be a, a kid from St. Louis or something, but that was, but that was a, for sure. Yeah, that was a shitty one, two, three, but we knew the Steiners were going over anyway, and they're going to show it again. I remember thinking back then, did they really get a three count? Uh, he, here's the replay again. Great timing on the Frankensteiner takes a kid who knows how to take it. Uh, and certainly, uh, Rocco did. He counted one right there. One, you see, and then when he covered, he counted two and three. So yeah, they were out of hey, time US here. It was clearly that they were, it was clear that they were out of time and trying to get to the finish as quickly as they could. Yeah. It felt like they could have done that match first though, and maybe not been as rushed, but you know, it is what it is. Gary Michael Capetta here has, uh, his work cut out for him because there's 912 matches on this show. Exactly. And Gary always uses a cue card. Uh, and now we're going to see, uh, the team from uh, great Britain of Norman smiley from the West Indies and gentleman, Chris Adams had a question on Twitter, uh, since the last time you and I've talked, uh, what could you tell me about Chris Adams backstage, which I thought was awfully weird. <laughs> what could I tell you about Chris Adams backstage? Chris Adams was a pretty cool guy backstage. I always thought it was cool to me. Uh, he had the, and there you see the stats. He had the super kick. We didn't get to know Norman too well at this time, but we would know him as you know, moving on down the road. Chat me up about, um, Pat O'Connor. Did you ever have any interaction with him? No, none. I didn't know any of the, the, I, the only Check guy out, the out there here, it says Ray Mysteric. I know Ray Mysteric. It'll go say Ray Mysteric here. It'll say Ray Mysteric, uh, in the, uh, stats, uh, full screen graphic here as well. And, uh, this is, uh, you see Conan on the right now. I, I, I liked the, the early Conan. He could do some great stuff. We should mention that Conan in this era is like the biggest superstar in professional wrestling in Mexico. I mean, like it's not right. even close. And, you know, a lot of people have called him like the Mexican Hulk Hogan, but this is a guy who very early in his career was driving around Mexico in a Ferrari for cash. I mean, this is a big time star in a hurry. Um, you know, 88, 89, 90, those were really big time years. And then he went on to have an incredible run before we ever saw him back on American TV. And this was my first introduction to him here. And. I know a lot of people probably don't even recognize him because he's got the mask on here. And so many people are familiar with that NWO version with no mask. Right. And I remember the first time we saw him was around this time in center stage. And he came, we had a blue mask and never will forget it. And he did some tremendous, Ooh, that's got to hurt. He did some, all right. I don't know what that's about, but there goes Chris Adams ducking and a double drop kick from the other side. Both men go out. Uh, Conan did some spectacular stuff and look how he look his upper body. Look how good he looked back then. Uh, and not only that, let's, uh, let's also, you know, more about the luchadors than I do. Let's not, if the fans are scratching their head, seeing Ray Mysterio, uh, the guy that we know is Ray Mysterio jr. Yeah. He's often referred to as Ray Mysterio senior in actuality though. Uh, he only did that to distinguish himself from his nephew. So the very attractive Ray Mysterio Jr., as Tony mm -hmm. would remind you, is actually right. his nephew, not his son. I know that's confusing. Super kick there from Chris Adams. Chris Adams is probably the guy who's 
you know, deserves all the credit for making that a very popular finishing move here in the United States, right? That was his move. He did a, a great handspring as well. And of course we were on Ray Mysterio down on the floor. So we missed that shot, but now we're going to tag in Conan to see Conan come in. It's amazing how Conan looks in the upper body, how strong he looks and big. He wanted, uh, uh, Norman Smiley to get in, and uh, we've got two performers, great performers, going at it right here. Look what Conan could do. This is th- uh, this is before we saw Rey Mysterio Jr. do all the crazy stuff that he would do. And look how big Conan is in being able to do things like this. I think back in 1990, it really, oh, Fisherman Suplex, one, only got a one cap. Uh, back in 1990, this really opened our eyes. It really did. There's some of the things we could do. Trying to backslide, and here Mysterio drop kicks him into a backslide. One, two, and a kick out, thanks to the uh, Chris Adams coming in and, and stomping on Conan. Now Adams, as we probably know, was was very oh, a very very big star. I think he was a star in Georgia too, but he was a very big star in world class wrestling, wasn't he? Oh, absolutely, a huge star there. Uh, helped put Steve Austin in the business. Uh, right. he was obviously stone Colts trainer and that's probably his legacy at this point, but he had one heck of a run prior to that. I feel like I should correct myself in my notes. I just wrote that, uh, the tag team partner, of uh, uh, who was in the South African team that we talked about earlier, Kruger, mm-hmm. I wrote that he was doinking my notes and I guess I just freestyled a minute ago. That, that was Matt Osborne. That's actually Ray Apollo who played, uh, okay. doink after Matt Osborne. So not the big Josh yeah. version of doing right. Yeah. I thought maybe he had a little bit uh, more of a hairline as big Josh, yeah. but I was gonna let you go with it. You know, <laughs> partners don't, don't point out mistakes oh, that partners make. Right? Well, I, I do. So correct me. Uh, that's my bad, okay. but okay. Cle- clearly super kick. Look at that maneuver one, two, and Ray Mysterio comes in for the save. Uh, this actually ended up being one of the better tag matches during this shitty tournament. You know, I know we made fun of this whole idea of the different nations a minute ago, but it's really working right here because it explains why there is a Mexican team that we might not have normally seen. And obviously these guys are super talented and we've got the same here, you know, on the Norman Smiley, Chris Adams side so far in this tournament, we've had nothing but very talented performers. And we've got to boot Starcade, uh, ring post bats. Fancy. This was around the same time that you guys started to get the ruse sponsorship, right? Ruse was just a little bit after this, but I mean, that's one of the things that you guys sold. I think is right. Maybe, maybe one of the, uh, the wraps here is to let people know that, Hey, we can sell this. This is an opportunity yeah. for us to advertise because boxing had made a lot of money with that concept. Absolutely. Conan goes down from running shoulder block. Oh, both men send Chris Adams down and now watch out right down to Jim Ross. They go. And here's the double team as Adams on the outside, seen some great moves. Conan, uh, communicating in Spanish here, by the way, I should say, uh, picks up with a gut wrench, has him up on top. And what's he going to do here? You talk about improvising here. Oh, that took a lot of strength that time just to get him over from both guys. Yes, it did. And now bridging out one, two, three, and gets the one, two, three. All right. Conan and Ray Mysterio, <laughs> who just hurls himself out of the ring. It's interesting. I know the match is over. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting oh how many times he's announced here because here they announced the winners as the team of Conan and Ray Mysterioso. And so Jr. starts to question himself because he's been calling him Ray Mysteric because the graphic said that. And then during the match, he actually calls him Ray Mysterio. And then here he says it again. Well, maybe it's Ray Mysterio. So it's just so WCW that this fucker had three names in 10 minutes. <laughs> it is so WCW is right. Let's take a look at the replay again. Uh, both men, really great performers here. And this is the power that I, you gotta be able to, as a, as the other guy, you got to be able to push off. I know to help him get him over, but that showed the strength of Conan. Very impressed with Conan's look and all the things he can do. And 
take a look at this. It's almost like a version of the figure eight, isn't it? <laughs> a one, two, three count. Well, coming up, I think we've got, uh, one of the highlights of the show. Hmm. Is this going to be our, uh, Canadians <laughs> against our Russians? <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right. Well, this was Starcade collision course. Uh, and, uh, how about it? Check it out. Wow. Missy Hyde looking live. Alexandra York, of course, Marlena, Terry Runnels looking live. And of course the grandfather of the Wyatt family or, in there as well. Poor father, the uh, forefather. I think it was, I think he's just their dad. I don't think he's their grandfather. Yeah. I think that's black. Well, track. I was I was trying to put him in that in that character. You see, because oh, he'd be old. He'd be an old son of a bitch in the white family right now. So it would have to be the grandfather. So when did you know that uh, Terry Ronalds was going to be a TV star? Uh, I had that lunch with her and talk with her about um, about uh, portraying this character. This is a, you know, again, Ole Anderson said, you know, she's good looking. Uh, there's something we'd be able to do with her. And then we put her up in front of a camera and rolled tape on her. And, uh, she did a couple of things and, uh, we thought, you know, she's, uh, she's got that arrogant look about her. She can portray an arrogant bitch. If you will, I think she's going to be good. And this was, uh, this was a pretty, for what it was, it was a pretty decent little angle. Uh, this is, you know, they they, uh, say they going to beat Terry Taylor in less than eight minutes and 32 seconds. That's a good gimmick. That's what they, you know, that's yeah, a good is. gimmick. This is not a good gimmick. Talk us through who we're seeing here. Jacko victory. And of course, Rip Morgan, who was the longtime flag bearer, I guess, for the, uh, sheep herders before they were the bushwhackers. Uh, here they are, uh, the team from South Africa, uh, I guess. Now, South Africa was the first one. This is the Royal no, family. Okay. This is New Zealand. Okay. Sorry. I got my countries mixed up. The Royal family from New Zealand. All right. Uh, Jocko victory, which is also Jack victory, uh, who, uh, wrestled some in extreme wrestling, I guess, down the road. Uh, we mentioned rip Morgan rip was a very good performer. I thought, uh, but this was a really a shitty look, but now here comes one of the, uh, tough guys from Japan, Mr. Sato. And of course the great fucking muta this was pretty apparent from the get-go this was set up to be the steiners against guys from japan of course rip morgan was a part of the sheep herders is the name you were looking for before the bushwhackers and did, what uh, did i say well no you I said, I said you, oh maybe you did say i just thought you said before he, he was their the flag bearer for the sheep herders before yeah. they were the bushwhackers right yeah he went on to, uh, promote wrestling in New Zealand. So that much is at least not a gimmick from him. Of course, mm -hmm. Jack victory. Uh, he's anything but from New Zealand. I mean, dudes from yeah. dudes from Jersey, I believe. Yeah, exactly. And the great Muda and Mr. Sato, uh, talking about a contrast in styles. Well, I guess you can say that, uh, Muda's style is, uh, certainly different than most anybody else's what around a, this time. What a pop that Muda got here. Muda is a guy who really just, uh, captured the imagination of American fans in 89 with his, um, feud with sting. And now here he right. is in 90. And even though I guess technically they're supposed to be the heels there, Muda is, a, is an over character with this audience. Well, it's one of these, one of those guys that did so, so many sensational things uh, he could, could not only do sensational things, he could work and sell. And so he was over with the fans and that's why he would get such a pop. Now I was not in WCW in 1989, but I think, uh, anybody who was in wrestling, like I was in the WWE in 1989, knew how over Muda was. And we were seeing part of it here against Jocko victory. See, everything Muda did was so good. He was so quick at every movement. What did, um, what did the boys wow. think of working with Muda? They loved it. They absolutely loved it. They respected him and they, they loved what he could do. Uh, and, uh, I, there was, there was no problems with Muda at all that I knew of. Do you think if Muda had a mouthpiece 
besides Gary Hart that he would have had a bigger career in WCW? Is that what was missing for him? Uh, that's, that's a good point. I, it would have to be the right mouthpiece. I don't think Sonny Ono would have worked for him. Paulie dangerously might've worked for him. That, that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, yeah. Paulie with Muda feels like that could have been money as his right. sort of sting killer. You know, if, if Paulie was the mouthpiece for the, for Muda in, in the feud with sting, I think Muda could have been a much bigger star than he was. Yeah, I agree. And uh, Paulie would have been the right guy. Uh, and here's Mr. Sato who didn't know that much about him, but he always, I don't, I'm not to say that he, I guess it's the, the, uh, lack of, uh, communication that I had with the Japanese, but he was always, he always seemed like a, a badass to me, a legit badass. Well, I mean, he is, I asked McDonald's, <laughs> we should admit, I, I mentioned that because six years prior to this. Uh, he and Ken Patera had an incident outside of a McDonald's and, okay. uh, they both got in a little bit of trouble. I, mean, I remember that. that. I didn't, re I remember the, I remember the Ken Patera story. I didn't know Mr. Sato was involved in that. Um, we should mention too, he's a two time WWF world tag team champion. Do you remember who his partner was? Mr. Fuji. There you go. Look at there. How about that? Is it me or, or does Rip Morgan remind you? Uh, of the Dalton character from Bloodsport. <laughs> yes, he does. I wish he would look right at the camera right now and yell, nerds. <laughs> uh, Snapmare takeover by the great Muda. See, everything Muda did, look at that. That elbow was so good. It was like a corkscrew elbow. And then he would go back to the attack. And the way he would just pull on parts of the body. You know, you, you, uh, again, you know, so many kids and so many young guys go through training. I don't, I don't think you can, you can teach that. I think you got to have a knack for it. And Jacko uh, calls the break that time on the back of Mr. Sato. See, Mr. Sato just, <laughs> he just, uh, I, I, uh, he just strong and it just seemed like, I don't know, I guess maybe I was intimidated by him. I don't know. And maybe I shouldn't have been because I was never intimidated by Mr. Fuji back in the WWE. He seemed like a good guy. Sato here. It said that he placed like seventh in the Olympics in like uh 64. Was that legit? Mm. No, 64. Yeah. They, they, said, means they said some sort of un, I mean, some ridiculous thing here. No, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not so sure. Uh, I, I haven't, I've never looked him up, but that would make him like what? Like almost well, 60 right now. Wouldn't well, it? No, he, he was born in 42. Okay. So that could have been right. Yeah. He's, uh, I think he's still with us. I think he's 75 now. Okay. Yeah. So if you're not familiar, Ken Patera was refused service at a McDonald's after they closed. So he threw a giant fucking boulder. Uh, through the window in retaliation. Mm. And when they arrived at Patera and Sato's hotel room, some shit went down. Sato was uncooperative and, uh, they assaulted the officers taking turns mm. beating on them until other officers arrived and, uh, took care of business here. So they were, uh, convicted and sentenced to serve two years in prison. Wow. Two tough guys. No question. Ken Patera was as tough as they come. And there is a fisherman suplex for you. Or is it one, two, three. And, uh, Jocko had to make sure he had that right shoulder down to get the one, two, three, get rid of the uh, New Zealanders. Thank God. And that's the end of that. See, I always thought going into this, that I, I guess we tried to make this legit. We had the Steiners. We had these, this Japanese duo. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we're going to see the Russian team here pretty soon mm -hmm. and it's, it's not your gimmick Russian team. Uh, and this just seemed to me to, I, I don't know the handspring elbow there may have, but Muda made everything look impressive just with, uh, the way he would move. And I'm glad they didn't show the finish on replay because clearly it was not a smooth finish. 
So Japan moves on. I'm sorry. I almost, uh, Japan, Japan. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Um, Paul E is going to talk. I don't know what Muda is doing with these fingers in his mouth here. But isn't that how he used to like pretend to cue up the mist? Yeah, I guess it did. So Sato and just looks angry all the time. I know he does. That that's why I always was kind of intimidated by him. The green tongue. Now, it, it looks like uh Mood has been in the fun dip. Now Paul E sets up the Steiners here, the Steiner match. Fans respond to that. And of course the Steiners were big in Japan as well. And a lot of this was done. We would, we would book these guys from Japan, uh, just to try to continue to build a relationship with new Japan pro wrestling back then. We should mention, um, that during the opening match, Jr. announced that, uh, flair had withdrawn from the tag team title match, uh, that he was supposed to be tagging with Barry Windham or tagging with, uh, Arn Anderson rather. And instead Barry Windham would replace him. And he yeah. says that Rick, uh, was in an attack and, uh, he was injured. So instead of seeing Rick and Arn take on doom, it's going to be Arn and Barry Windham take on doom later today. And they're going to show that limousine attack that was perpetrated by Teddy long. They're going to show that a little bit later on in this uh, pay-per-view just to show you what happened. All right. <laughs> uh, I have to laugh. Uh, this yeah. team from, from Canada. I tried to do some research on Bull Johnson and uh, Troy Montour. The, I couldn't find a thing on them. Well, I think this looks like if I was an Indian right now, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right. He's a, uh, wow. 450 pounds can buy my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 600 pounds combined. Uh, not favored against the USSR. Interesting enough, if you're sending home, you're thinking, oh, the Russian team has got to be like Crusher or Ivan or Nikita. Yeah. I mean, that's some gimmick that, Russian team. That's what you expect. I mean, we've been raised to believe that. And now it looks like the fucking Olympic team's coming out here. Well, these two guys did were amateur wrestlers from the Soviet Union. Legit. These two guys did, from what I read... Uh, go on to wrestle a little bit with, uh, with, uh, in Japan, in pro wrestling, uh, after their amateur careers, they didn't last long. Uh, but here they are. Let me, let me just say uh, that fucking Victor here looks like if he doesn't win the match, he can at least defrag your hard drive. Like this dude <laughs> builds computers on the side. I know for sure he does. I've been to his shop, right? To me, it looks like, uh, it looks like Luigi of Mario Kart. Uh, old Salmon here. It looks like an extra from the Sopranos. That's right. Uh, and, uh, when, uh, when Victor takes off his, his jacket, you're going to see that he is apparently in the Dutch Mantel family tree. Yeah. He and Miguel well. Perez uh, all bring their own sweaters. They're never cold. Wow. Check that out. Would you? So what we're going to have here, guys that are, that are, that have done a little bit of pro wrestling, but are as shoot amateur wrestlers, look at the cauliflower ear that's that a, Victor's got. It's a great point. Wow. You, you've got to be thinking if you're across, like if you're me over there in the Indian outfit, aren't yeah. you like, fuck, I want to go second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah. Cause I'm getting ready to get my fat ass stretched. Holy snakes. Unbelievable that this is a. Not only on a pay-per-view, but it's your premier yeah. pay-per-view. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. And, you know, we got guys who they, they, they're, I would say they're going to drag this thing down, but they work pretty hard in an amateur way. I feel like we should mention that, uh, people are working hard for you right now over at seat geek. I don't know if you're in the loop on this with seat geek, Tony, but now I use SeatGeek all the time. I found that buying tickets to sporting events and concerts can be complicated and confusing. It's a lot easier with SeatGeek because it's so smart and easy. 
And I use this to get to every type of live event, including the playoffs where Alabama will play Clemson. And uh, we appreciate Wisconsin doing the job to allow that to happen. So if you're looking for a last minute deal or planning a night out or looking for the perfect gift, do what I do. Go to SeatGeek. They're going to help you find the best seats and at the best prices. And it's fully guaranteed. And uh, there's nothing like seeing your favorite team. Of course, mine's Alabama. SeatGeek is going to help me. And uh, I even put the app on my phone. Have you used this yet, Tony? Yes, I have. As a matter of fact, I I knew that you were going to talk sports about it, but you can get a lot more than just sporting events with SeatGeek. I use the SeatGeek app on my phone to get Lois and I tickets to the Brian Setzer Orchestra in their Christmas show uh, at Atlanta Symphony Hall coming up this week. It's by Uh, far the easiest way to shop for tickets, is it not? It is. You could you, just a couple of clicks and you can get your ticket. Not only that, and this is one great thing about SeatGeek, you can see where your tickets are. You can, If you're going to an event, going to see uh, Clemson and Alabama at the Sugar Bowl, you can see what your vantage point is going to be just by clicking. Not only where your seat is, you can see your vantage point. So SeatGeek, man, they're making your ticket buying experience easier than ever. You're going to save time and money because they search all the different ticket sites and compare the prices and get you the best possible deal. You get the most bang for your buck and they're going to grade every ticket based on value to help you immediately identify the best seats in your budget. I should also mention that every purchase is fully guaranteed. So you should shop with confidence. SeatGeek makes it happen. They did for me. So make SeatGeek your go-to app for finding the best deals on every type of ticket, sports, concerts, comedy, theater, whatever. But best of all, we've got a special offer, right, Tony? Yeah, listeners of What Happened When can get $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. That's $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. Download the SeatGeek app, enter promo code What Happened today. That's enter pro, promo code What Happened. And you get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. That's a pretty good deal. Well, that's not a pretty good deal. That's a hell of a deal. It's a much better deal than old Bull Johnson. Uh, is getting here he had to finally holler for mercy and let troy in and all of a sudden troy's in the corner doing the hustle he wants nothing to do with these amateur badasses yeah absolutely because they can stretch you and uh we go from seat geek to some wrestling geeks calling a wrestling match here uh so this is bull from canada i guess he is from uh, calgary no i think in the ring right now this is not bull this is uh troy montour Oh, this is Troy Montour? Yeah. Okay. So I guess he's from Calgary, though, because he has the horseshoe on his tights. And th- there were so many, uh, again, uh, there, were, there were so many really good Canadian wrestlers. This is, <laughs> this is all we could come up with. Was, uh, was, that his, was that his war dance right there? Was that? Yeah. It's the big and tall war dance. Okay. Wow. Wahoo McDaniel. God bless him. Yeah. Who I, could I, do it. It's amazing to me that this is what it was. By the way, in case you missed it, that was the fucking finish. Uh, I know it was. It's like probably someone from the back said, would you tell them to go home? And the referee says, I can't communicate with them. So it doesn't matter. Make them go home. It was a legitimate so suplex. And uh, whether you wanted right. to kick out or not, it was not happening. And it was called a submission hold. And there you go. Final four, USA, Mexico. Uh, the Soviet Union, Japan, and thank God we don't have to see the Canadian team nor the New Zealand team uh, once again. So really, we've got some uh, some pretty good performers. What Meanwhile, you, think of this concept, them doing this tag team pay-per-view. Oh, here you go. Do the promo for us. Okay. Tony, I'd like to say something, a couple of things about you, first of all. Your hair is pretty. Uh, not only that, you're yucking a lot. In other words, your voice sounds phony. It's nothing like your real voice. So why don't you stop it? I'd also like to say that I know that Ric Flair is the Black Scorpion. And I know throughout this entire Black Scorpion bullshit that we have gone with many ideas of who's going to be the Black Scorpion. And finally, right at the very end, Flair said, okay, fuck it. I'll be the Black Scorpion. So Flair, you and I will wrestle one more time. That's right. We'll wrestle one more time. You agreed to be the black scorpion. Only thing I can say is Tony, thank God this gimmick's over. That's right. Sting. Thanks God. This gimmick's over. You know, I, 
I went back and listened to this thing. God, I was, my voice was so phony back then. Did you notice that? Yeah. You were always a big piece of shit. Meltzer had it right. <laughs> Why did I throw you that softball, man? You, you being from Alabama, I know you're a softball player. I should never toss it up in the air. Okay. We're going to go back and take a look at the, uh, this is the uh, gimmick leading up to, Ooh, smack the shit out of Terry Taylor. Yeah, baby. No, Paulie says, don't hit a woman. Don't hit a woman. <laughs> and Terry Taylor says, that's no lady. And, uh, <laughs> of course the idea here is he's tired of being cock a doodle do man. So right. he's here to feud with uh, rotundo or Mr. Wall street before he becomes IRS and gets a major pay raise. And this is a long time before we ever reintroduced to Marlena. And I've got to tell you as a wrestling fan, I didn't immediately put together that Marlena with gold dust was Terry Boatwright, who we saw here is Alexandria York. Right. I didn't immediately put that together. Yeah. She, uh, kind of, uh, blossomed. Wouldn't you say Conrad with a little help from her friends? Yeah. She blossomed quite well. Uh, you and I both know Terry very well right now. Not Terry Taylor, of course, Terry Boatwright, uh, very well right now. She is a, just a sweet, sweet girl, uh, who is, who was absolutely scared to death every time she walked out on camera, every time she walked into the ring. And then of course, as she's told the story many times when she became Marlena, Vince had her wrestle and she would actually go in the back before her matches and be so nervous. She would throw up. Well, um, I'm glad that she, uh, she got comfortable because she did a great job as Marlena and this was sort yeah. of how she cut her teeth and. I never really liked this wall street gimmick. And I think most people remember this the second time they saw it, uh, like the early nitros, he was back. We should, right. we should mention here that, uh, the stats for Terry Taylor, make sure to mention his father is a medical doctor and that his finishing move is the five arm. And that's a little different than the baby's arm, right? That's a much different than the baby's arm. Uh, and of course, uh, you know what? I saw five arm there and I'm thinking in my head when I'm watching this, Conrad's going to say something about a baby's arm there. Uh, thank you for not disappointing. Uh, I think we tried to, as a, well, I know as a company, we tried to find a gimmick for Mike Rotunda because Rotunda was a good performer. As you can see, the clock is running now. The, the idea is that the computer has said that Terry Taylor can be beaten in less than eight minutes and 32 seconds. That's right. So now a pretty good little storyline for this uh, match. Wouldn't you say when we've had a couple of matches that meant absolutely nothing? No, I totally agree because, and again, they're doing what they can to make every match matter here. And I thought the, um, the situation with her slapping Terry gets a little bit of heat. You know, of course, Rotundo is, is someone that this audience is very familiar with and they're trying to make him a heel and being sort of a computer whiz you know, is a little bit of a gimmick and it's one that can get heat with a Southern audience. Is that fair to say? Right. Yeah. Uh, J Jr. and, uh, and Paulie are putting over the fact that he has been featured in USA today. Uh, and it, I, I thought it was funny, uh, that we portrayed it, put a light on it as if we were saying he's such a big star and such a, uh, a big guy on wall street that they are talking about him on a national level when in effect they were kind of laughing at it. Well, of what course, they were doing, yeah, of making course. fun of it, but Hey, yeah, when, uh, this is, uh, this is the era in wrestling where any publicity is good publicity, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and finally, during the course of this, uh, Jr. kind of break through and says, you know, this is Mike Rotundo who was a great wrestler in Syracuse. And he, and he gives as Jr had done him many, many times him, you know, played football at Syracuse, wrestled at Syracuse or whatever he did and kind of tied it all together. But little did we know that Mike Rotunda was very good with his investments on wall street as well. And with making professional wrestlers, two people on the main roster shot out of this man's penis. Mm hmm. Um, Terry Taylor, a <laughs> lot of people have what? What? You just, you make it sound like, Psh, and there he is Ray Wyatt <laughs> main, main event and pay-per-views. 
<laughs> follow the well let's be quiet about what you should follow um so she's typing away here yeah maybe she's getting ready for her podcast so number mm. seven and number eight are their rankings here in the wcw top 10 if i would have told you before we actually started watching this show that wall street and terry taylor would be in the top 10 of the company would you have believed me no not at all me either no uh, which one of Rotunda's gimmicks did you like the best? Regular Mike Rotunda, Captain Mike Rotunda, IRS on the WWF, VK Wall Street. What are you going with? Uh, my favorite was, and I don't know if this was Captain Mike Rotunda. I liked it when he and Barry were a tag team in the WWF. Oh yeah. I'm a, I'm a fan of that. Yeah. yeah. The first Saturday night's main event and all that. Uh, what were they? What was the name of the team? The American, uh, American something. That was my favorite Mike Rotunda. Well, so. I think, every, you know, for me, it's still IRS because that's what I grew up on. And I can see back, right. you know, if I was an adult, there's fucking no way I would have liked that. But as a kid, I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah, I agree. Right now we have five minutes to go. Uh, and as you can tell, you know, uh, this also, when I, when I see Terry boat right here, I, I do want to let people know, and we'll get into this a little bit more when we see the main event. Hello, Terry. You're so beautiful. Uh, we get into the main event that uh, Terry Boatwright was, uh, had front row ringside tickets to, uh, Ric Flair's naked run later that night to the St. Louis Marriott. Oh my gosh. I love it. This is the night of that. You know, this is, this is the night of it. So both of these guys, it's, it's kind of fun the way the talent trade was happening a lot because both of these guys have been in both places. Of course, Terry Taylor was, um, a big star for Bill Watts. And then he was briefly with the NWA and Jim Crockett before he winds up as the red rooster. That doesn't take long before he's sick of that. And he's back here. And as you mentioned, uh, Rotunda was at the very first WrestleMania tagging with Barry Windham, uh, as a part of the U S express and they had us express Lou right. Albano with them. So both of these guys at this point, have been big stars for a couple of different companies. Do you consider them at this point in their career, sort of journeyman wrestlers, because they've bounced around a little bit based on being really, really good mid card guys, but were never really able to break through to the main events. Uh, journeyman. Uh, I don't know if journeyman is the right word or not, but I think they're mid card guys. You know, you know, l let's face it. Neither one could really cut a great promo. Uh, and at that point, held them back. Uh, let's not, we've talked about it so many times. Let's not forget how important it was back then to be able to do an interview. The guys who did great interviews, for instance, if Mike Rotunda could have talked like Arn Anderson, don't you think he could have gone a lot further? No doubt about it. A uh, little, right. bit, little bit of trouble on our internet connection. We apologize for that. Tony and I are not broadcasting in the same place today. Uh, Lois is on the war path. Do I have that right, Tony? She always is on the war path, but even more so. As we get towards the holidays, it's miserable. Oh, a jawbreaker that time. Can well, you hear me? Cast, cast, yeah, cast. Let me, let me go ahead and, and make a suggestion for our listeners. If if they've got a wife like Lois and they're just trying whatever they can to make her happy, go to $8.com. Yeah. $8 $8.com is the place to be, my friends. You see, there you can get affordable gifts. These are fine gifts. And how much do they cost, Tony? They cost $8, Conrad. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about getting the elegant stud earrings for Lois. What's cool about those earrings is when you actually click on the website, $8.com, the earrings come in a variety of different colors. I mean, you can get them rose colored or platinum plated or gold colored, whatever you're looking for. And by the way, it's $8. They've got a bunch of different stuff and a lot of different colors for the ladies in your life. And maybe you got a wife like Lois. Maybe you're just looking to pick up something for the ladies at the office. You can get whatever you're looking for. Aunts, cousins, all your shopping for the ladies. And it's only $8 at $8.com. That's the number eight, $8, $8.com. And uh, go ahead and pick it up now just in time for Christmas. Call the finish here. The stock market crash. Oh, is that what it was called? I was looking through my notes here. I didn't, I can't remember what it was called. The stock market crash. But as you can see, Alexander York shows the printout that it in effect was correct. There you go. Here's here it comes finish. the five arm. 
by Terry Taylor, not to be considered uh, confused with the baby's arm that we will see later on the night at the Marriott yeah. ad nauseum. And then a one, two, but he got the foot on the ropes. Uh, and right now the truck is screaming. Uh, do you have the finish? Yes, we do have the finish. We've got the stock market crash. Oh, Terry Taylor, right across the top rope. Boy, these, these replays were like forever and ever and ever. Good shot of Rotunda's ass. <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh and my And now, oh, whoa. How about Holy this? Shit. Dude, dude, dude. That'll make you want. That don't make you want to leave the country. I want you at Wrestle War 91. <laughs> Here's Wrestle War 91. It's coming up in February. We're putting the steel cage together. I'm going to be playing softball. Fuck this. <laughs> As they build the steel cage <laughs> for Sunday, February 24th. And if we're still in business, call your local cable operator for availability from Phoenix, Arizona. It sucks. It stinks. <laughs> <laughs> oh god i wasn't ready for that <laughs> jesus christ you know what's that, great is michael hayes did not have to get that costuming from wcw he just had that like he just, he just wore that oh uh, you know what when when it's all said and done i know you're going to agree with me and I, I here we see big cat and motor city madman coming in uh michael hayes is one of our favorite guys he oh is my so gosh my, the best. He's the best. Yeah, he is so funny. Oh man, I just enjoy talking to him. He gets a bad rap to online, to by the way. Did you know that? What's that? There's a lot of fans who give him a lot of shit online. He gets a really bad rap from online. Oh, fans. he does. Yeah. God, well, they don't really know him. Michael Hayes is one of the was one of the most t- talented guys ever. You think they're the Freebirds could have been what they were without a Michael Hayes? Absolutely not. And uh, listen. Michael Hayes was instrumental in this star K 2017 we just saw, and, uh, he is one of the most talented guys ever in the business. If you've given Michael Hayes shit, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. How about this? Sid looks like mm-hmm. a million bucks. Yep. And Dan Spivey, by the way, is doing a lot of good for a lot of people these days. Did you know that he owns a rehab facility now? I did not know that he's actually helping someone from the wrestling world who, uh, is going through a tough time right now and down in Florida. And, um, yeah, he's still helping people in real life. Of course here, he's breaking necks and cash and checks, but these right. days, um, he's trying to help you get clean and sober and he's helping a lot of people. So it's a really cool legacy that he's been able to go on to create for himself outside of wrestling. Of course, big cat that we're seeing here is who we would know to go on to become uh, Mr. Hughes or Curtis Hughes and, right. the, and the motor city madman. Uh, he was a Coke dealer. Right. So we don't, so we don't give a shit about him, but we know that, uh, Curtis is probably the best worker here. They tried to get him up and I guess he didn't want to go up that time or, uh, the spot wasn't right. But Curtis as a big guy, 300 pound guy could, could take some great bumps. And you know, Sid was, uh, Sid was pretty much over at this time. If, if anybody could get over in WCW besides the horseman and sting, it's worth mentioning that, uh, the motor city madman the next year would go on to be ranked in uh, pro wrestling illustrated's PWI 500. Did you know that Tony? <laughs> no, yeah. no, I he, did not. He received the very prestigious number two ninety six. Oh, <laughs> there is the, the double power bomb. What's the best, what's the prestigious, uh, prestigious two ninety six. Well, it just means there were only 295 wrestlers in the United States better than him. Okay. Well, only 295. <laughs> okay. Is that match over so, already? Thank God. And here goes the Motor City Madman in the double team by the skyscrapers or whatever they were called back then. Sid Vicious with the, ooh, the softball home run four shot. Oh, and there goes Danny Spivey. You know, thank you for telling me about Danny Spivey. That's, that's great. I love hearing things like that. I love the finish here because the guy, the Coke dealer clearly thinks it's a pile driver and they're like, no fucker, right. get up here. We're doing a power bomb <laughs> with your mullet. <laughs> Sit the fuck down before we beat the fuck out of you. And that's it. Sid vicious and uh, dangerous. Danny Spivey are your winners. Here's Paulie dangerously. I love and this. I like this is the best. Yeah. I like to say a few things here about Sid vicious. All right. I'll say something about Danny Spivey and they pick his ass up and they say, we want to look, 
look at you eye to eye. <laughs> and of course, Danny gives a pretty good promo here. And Sid Vicious just does a couple of screaming. Uh, take a look at Sid Vicious. Watch Sid Vicious's eyes. Sid was one of these guys. See, look at him there. Sid was one of these guys we had to take the monitor away from when he was doing an interview because he would look at himself all the time. Watch him. There he's looking at the monitor again, making sure he's got the mean look. He's not concentrating on what he's going to say. He's going to scream again. Sid Vicious rule the world. Yeah, look at the monitor. There you go. When did you realize that Sid had an issue with trying to watch himself rather than focus on the performance? Oh, I, I knew that immediately. I, uh, Lex Luger was like that too. There was a lot of guys who were like that. Uh, back in the old days in Jim Crockett promotions, we had a monitor in front of the camera. And if a guy would come in and he would just look at the monitor, the next time Jackie Crockett would just turn the monitor around. So I wouldn't look at himself. Of course, we've got uh, Ricky Morton, one of the best wrestlers of all time on his way to the ring with Tommy Rich, Wildfire. And um, he's being introduced as being from Atlanta. And of course, right. the usual lineup would be the Rock and Roll Express. But Robert Gibson, I think here, had a torn ACL. Do I have that right? He did. He had to have surgery, as a matter of fact. And uh, the, the storyline was the Freebirds tore up his knee. Uh, but now we're going to see Ricky Morton and, uh, Tommy rich. Somebody say something about getting fired up in St. Louis. How does that sound? I know I'm not Bruce Pritchard, but, uh, no, that, that wasn't bad. I, I think the best okay. actually might be hurricane Helms. Have you heard, uh, Shane do it? No, I've not. Oh, it's tremendous. You know, it's, it's funny. We, uh, a year ago, did you go to the only Anderson roast? I did. Uh, last yeah. Year? And I saw you, uh, you stole the show with that, by the way. Okay. I, I thought Tommy Rich was, was pretty funny because they brought up Tommy Rich. Tommy says, I don't know why we're, we're saying we're honoring Ole Anderson because he sucks. <laughs> Look, it's the free bird the, school of dance, man. If we, yeah. when we do a live show again and sell tickets, yeah. me and you are coming out like this and fucking pointing at each other. I'm not wearing the rebel flag paint, but I'll, I'll do the point and dance with you. <laughs> you got it, buddy. Yeah, the rebel flag face paint doesn't work and it doesn't work on their capes as well. But, but, but I have to say, maybe you'll disagree with me that bad street USA was one of my favorite all time wrestling songs. Oh, no doubt. And, uh, isn't it great? It's awesome. When you get uh Hayes drunk and you just start playing it, he'll sing along. How about little Richard Marley here? Can you describe this for me? It looks like something that was that like one of the aborigines from uh, Australia, you know, that you see out, out in the uh, outback. Oh, you're saying you look like oh. an extra from crocodile Dundee. Yes, that's exactly what he looks like. So now we've got a, we got a black guy painted up and two guys with rebel flags on their back. I, I'm sure, Boy. I'm sure in their head, it's okay if we wear the rebel flag because we've got a black guy with us, but sure. boy, this does not age well. Wow, man. Goodness gracious. That does not. But again, it's uh, give Michael Hayes plenty of credit. You know, he, he thinks about things like this, politically incorrect or not. He thinks and take a look at all the mullets in the stands in 1990. Uh, we're going to, we're into a new decade at the end of the first year, the new decade, but still the eighties are very much alive. And there's Robert Gibson. Uh, the, uh, that, uh, that long, uh, brace you saw on Robert Gibson's leg yeah, was, was to hold his knee in place and also to hold his Johnson down or down the side of his leg. Right. So the, uh, it. the rumor in innuendo is that you guys actually used his penis as a stint. Right. That's that, that is probably the, the case. And here's Ricky Morton and a lot of great action that the fans are not buying right now. Well, now I think they they're not buying it because. They want to see the real rock and roll express. And, and it, it is a little disappointing that we've got one half of the midnight express here and one half of the rock and roll express. And we're not able to get the real deal on either side. I feel like by this point, Tommy Rich's better days in the business were behind him. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I don't think there's any question. Tommy Rich was a mega star matinee idol in Georgia championship wrestling. To the fact that we won the world title and kept it for like a day, 
won it in uh, Gainesville, lost it in Augusta, if I'm correct. But he's not the, the the people in St. Louis probably do not know who Tommy Rich is. Well, they know, but they know him as a guy who's enhancement talent at this point in WCW. And I guess yeah, you guys okay. were looking around for a blonde baby face that you could put with Ricky Morton and Tommy Rich wasn't doing shit. So, and Jim Barnett's around. So why not? Right. Yeah. Why, why not? Absolutely. Who do you think, uh, Jim Barnett mm. liked more in this match? Do you think it was little Richard Marley or Tommy rich? Well, I know where you're going with this. Uh, but I'm saying it was, Ooh, Robert Gibson. And he probably hurt himself that time. Uh, I would say he was always like Tommy rich based on some of the things I've heard you say. Well, you heard me say. Yeah, I'm blaming you for all this shit because so I started I, the rumor. I think I think that that title change happened like one one year after I was born. Okay, so <clears throat> tell me if if we can digress, else we are just not to talk over um, a Michael Hayes match and ignore it. But tell me what you've heard about Jim Barnett as it relates to Wildfire Tommy Rich. Well, listen, it's just one of those silly internet rumors. I don't think it's actually true, but it's been around for a long time that Tommy rich maybe did some okay. favors to become the world champion, world heavyweight champion. All right. And that's probably one of those silly internet rumors. Look at this. Oh my goodness. We have a figure four. Look at Michael selling that figure four on both sides and the break because we had uh two men in the ring calling for the break. Uh, again, fans respond when you can really tell, and that's what was happening right there. Well, and looks like Ricky's blowing up a little bit. I think this your is internet connection out. is blowing up a little bit too. We apologize again. If this was a traditional podcast, we would you know stop it and get going again. But you guys are watching with us, so we're going to try to power through, and we're going to do it live. Gee whiz, I feel sorry about that, Conrad. Um, I just had my internet worked on. All right. Yeah. Your, your Next, video is completely frozen for me. And, I, and that's the reason it's struggling a little bit for our listeners, but we're going to power through and Tony will kick out. If we could get Lois off goddamn Netflix and to clean the fucking dog hair, we'd all be winners. Oh. Hey, Lois. She may be passed, passed that on the floor. I'm not sure. She might be on the internet right now. I was trying to get her off of it. Well, let's go tell her to turn off stranger things and, uh, tell her to go pick out something nice over at $8.com. And then she'd get off the fucking internet. She could have those ear, those elegant diamond earrings in every single color. Yeah, absolutely. She could. And she'd love it too. She'd appreciate it. Meanwhile, the free birds. And Ricky Morton and Tommy rich giving us pretty good match right now. How would you describe the free bird wrestling attire here? This looks like, um, I don't know, like a double XL version of Chippendales. <laughs> yeah, I think that, 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 that would, uh, that would be, uh, well, with Michael, it may be triple XL now taking a look at that, uh, inner tube he's got around his gut, which by the way has, Ooh, there's that gimmick left hand of his. He would always be able to knock you down with it. Uh, Michael's, uh, inner tube around his midsection has got increasingly bigger over the years, but so is mine. So who am I to talk? He got himself in pretty good shape for, uh, the hall of fame a couple of years ago. He worked really hard for like a year trying to drop some LBs before he got on stage. Mm, well, good. That's, and of course it's. It's now gone back to the regular one. Oh, double coconuts. One of my favorite maneuvers. We should mention here that, uh, Ricky Morton has a podcast and I believe the rumor and innuendo is that he's going to have Ric Flair on sometime soon. So if you haven't really? already, be sure to check out Ricky Morton's podcast and, uh, tune in for that Ric Flair interview, which will be one of the first podcasts he's done, uh, since he's, uh, had that bout of illness that, uh, landed him in the hospital for the better part of two months. Have we talked much about Ric Flair's, uh, 30 for 30 on here? No, we have not outside of the fact that of course you're the person that chose to talk about the baby's arm. Yeah. How about that? Isn't that great? We'll, we'll talk about it when we see the main event a little bit later on and we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, <clears throat> Ric Flair in the, there's the one, two and a three and Ricky Morton and 
Wildfire Tommy Rich get the win. Fans really respond. Good finish. And a good win for Morton and, and Wildfire Tommy Rich. We'll talk more about Ric Flair when we see the Black Scorpion match coming up. Wait, are you suggesting that Ric Flair is going to be involved in the main event somehow? Well, yes. I, I think it was pretty apparent when the pod opened up. Oh, my goodness. They're beating up little Richard. So two guys in Confederate flags are beating up a black guy right now, right? Exactly. Okay. Right. So to make sure we had that <clears throat> right. Yeah. So they're roadie. Now pick up our, uh, pick up our capes with the Confederate flag and come on back to the dressing room with us. I mean, I guess that's an okay way to get heat, but you do have to, in hindsight, say, I don't know if that was so smart. Yeah. In 2017, maybe not in 1990. We didn't, we didn't, uh, worry about it with the exception of you do realize, and I don't want to get into any politics here. You do realize this was around the time of the Rodney King trial too. Well, it's before that at this point, Rodney King, it's not much happened. before it. Yeah. You want to call the replay here? Yes, I'll call the replay. Michael Hayes with the inner tube right around his Chippendale midsection goes out. A roll up by Ricky Morton. He gets the one, two, three. And then they look at the terrible thing they would do to Robert Gibson. Oh, sending him down with a double running clothesline. Ricky Morton and Tommy Rich are too late. Another bump from Robert Gibson. Now back to good look at himself. Now it was always a challenge to interview Stan Hansen. I love so Stan. This. Always <laughs> Stan. You, here's another thing about Stan too. And, and I think it's been well-documented, you know, Stan couldn't Stan was probably legally blind without his glasses. Almost. He had one of the worst eyesights ever. So when you're standing there holding a the microphone, you, I, I don't know if he sees me or not. I'm just probably a big blur to him. So I'm not so sure where I'm supposed to hold the microphone. If see, I'm backing up like what the fuck, of course, and it, it has a lot to do with that plug of tobacco in the, uh, the side of his mouth as well. But, you know, he was over as hell in Japan. As we all know, a good friend of Ole Anderson's. That's why he was with us. When Ole took the book, Ole brought him in as, uh, uh, as one of our stars, he was a U.S. heavyweight champion right now. And, uh, it, it, I always thought it was kind of hilarious that he would be going against, um, uh, going against Lex Luger because he and Lex Luger were certainly two completely different men in many ways. <laughs> Look at that pouring out of his mouth. And I didn't get any on me. That's what she said. Well, Stan Hansen is always one of my favorite performers and I really enjoy the match he has here with uh, Lex Luger. I know we've talked about their match at uh, Halloween havoc earlier this year. It's sort of interesting how much the company has changed in that short amount of time too, because we had Ric Flair working a tag match with uh, doom. And we also had Lex Luger and Stan Hansen. So all that sort of still in line, but instead of being in the main event with sting, that's not where Sid is. Sid's just kind of in a throwaway match here or so it seems with the big right. cat and the motor city madman. And it's not a part right. of the tournament. It seems like a, a little bit of a throwaway spot for Sid. And that's because Sid had a heat with Ole Anderson. So there there's Ray Mysteric again, or is that Mysterio? Roo Mysterioso. Mysterioso. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Conan and Mysterioso in the ring and here come the Steiner brothers at this point, where would you say the Steiner brothers as an act are on the card? Like is flair still the top guy in the promotion or at this point, in your opinion, is it sting? Uh, I, I, I think flair is still the top guy, then sting, then the Steiners. So you've got the Steiners There's above Luger and I, I need this poster. I'm at, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. If you've got it, yeah. I'd love to have that. Um, so let's go, let's go through it. Flair in your opinion is number one. Sting's number two. Steiner's are three. Is Luger four? Yeah, he would have to be number four. And then who's five? Is that up for debate or do, do you have a, yeah. a name? 
Well, I would kind of have to look at the roster, and if you got to look at the roster, well, maybe maybe Wyndham, and then Arn. Okay. Five and six. Uh, something's got to be said about Doom as a tag team. I, I like Doom as a tag team. I thought they had the look. They had a great. Uh, they had, and we're going to do an interview here with them in, in just a few moments. Uh, they had a great look. Had great music. Teddy Long could talk. I liked them as a tag team back then. Uh, so you know, I mean, if we're, if we're talking about we're talking about top performers, you got to link uh, lump the Steiners in together. And you know, Stan Hansen worked for us on a uh, semi regular basis. He wasn't kind of a regular guy back then. I'm really um, excited to have this match on the show because I, and I don't know that this makes sense for the biggest show for this tournament concept. I think in hindsight, that's probably not the best use of your biggest show. But Rey Mysterio and Conan and the Steiner brothers, everything about this is awesome, is it not? And check this move yeah. out. Call this for us, Tony. Absolutely. Oh, off the top of Top Rope Bulldog by Rick Steiner. Fans respond big time. Conan does a great job of selling face first on this. Wow. Nicely. That was such a dangerous move too. Conan, Conan kind of rolled out of the side. Won't do any more of this shit and bring in uh Ray Mysterioso. I'm, I'm sorry. Ray Mysteric. I think it's Ray Mysterio by this point. Okay. Thank God it is. And Scotty Steiner just tackles him down that time. Uh, you know, we talk so much about Scott Steiner and, and big Papa pump and, um, Shoney's and, uh, big Papa pump was a badass back at the end of WCW, but this was the best that Scott Steiner was right here. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, Scott Steiner is, um, one of my favorite wrestlers, at least in this era as a kid, I mean, he was probably to me. It's Sting, Lex Luger, and then Scott Steiner. And somewhere in there, Sid. Uh, but those are probably my four favorite wrestlers as a kid. Now, of course, I have a much greater appreciation for the Barry Windhams, the Arn Andersons, the Bobby Eatons, the Ric Flairs. But as a kid, man, Scott Steiner was super cool. Big jacked up yeah. guy, lots of big impact moves. And I don't think people really give him enough credit for the Frankensteiner. Because he's the first person to really make that thing work. In, in the, uh, United States, here's your finish. Yeah, the, absolutely. One, two, three, the power bomb picked him up and the Steiners get the win. He was great at the Frankensteiner. He could maneuver it, but it also took someone as we saw with Teddy Petty, uh, uh, Ted Petty a little bit earlier to be able to help him out and hook on as well. So, you know, never discount uh, the guy he was working with to be able to help make that Frankensteiner. Great. Here we see the replay again of the power bomb. As Mysterio tried to leap on top and Scotty just, or Rick Steiner, just put him down for the power bomb and got the one, two, three. So the USA now moves on to the championship of the Pat O'Connor Memorial International Tag Team Tournament. And they'll face the winners of the Soviet team and the team from Japan. Guess who's going to win this? Oh, uh, now back to Tony Schiavone. Uh, and now let's bring in my favorites, Arn Anderson and Barry Windham. And Arn and Barry, here's the fact. We're all going back to the St. Louis Marriott tonight. We're all going to drink a lot, a lot. Now, let's say, uh, I, I do want to stop what I'm doing. This is another WCW clusterfuck. If you watched it, I'm talking, we're talking, and they're playing the sound of this over us talking. So you can't hear what anyone is saying here. So this is, uh, again... Uh, us being us. And this was shot, uh, obviously in downtown Atlanta. You know, what's uh, funny, uh, right now, uh, Conrad, what's that, where that, where that was shot. Right. Okay. You know, what is right, you know, right there where that is shot. You know, what's there now? No. Mercedes Benz stadium. Oh, really? Isn't that something? That's awesome. All that was cleared out and Mercedes Benz stadium is right there where that was shot. Right. I always thought that was very interesting. All right, so now we're we're going to have a uh, tag team, no disqualification, anything goes match coming up for the world tag team title. That's going to have a finish 
that is going to be a, a yet another shitty finish. But you can't say it was a Dusty finish because Dusty wasn't booking right here. And now here come the Harry Russians. Luigi and, as Conrad so aptly said, one of the uh, extras from The Sopranos. I mean, it really looks like him. Yeah, it does. Were you a Sopranos fan? Oh, my gosh. The biggest. Yeah, me too. We had uh, the night of the final Sopranos. We had uh, Italian food that night. We got from a, a restaurant, brought it over here, and we all sit around and watched it. Great TV. Uh, <clears throat> we go from great TV to shitty TV. And now <laughs> here come Mr. Sato and the great Muda. Winner of this will go on to face the Steiners for the first ever, and may I say only, Pat O'Connor Memorial Tag Team Championship. And as we have found out earlier in the show, they'll be the champions of the universe. Uh, well, we haven't said enough about the, the fans. It was a great crowd that night. I don't know if you uh, found out uh, what the gate was or if we had a sellout or not, but it looked damn good on TV. I'm a big fan of, uh, Muda and anytime we get to see Muda in this era, um, but I can't help but wonder in hindsight, how cool would it have been to see sting and Muda in the main event? Yeah, I think it would have been, but hadn't we seen enough of sting and Muda by that time? Well, perhaps you're right. I mean, right. we probably needed more Ric Flair sting. We hadn't seen that before. <laughs> well, we had, no, we didn't. We had black scorpion. Against Sting here in the main event. And the Luigi with a gut wrench trying to pick up the great Muda. Great Muda with a wide base. And he, oh, wow. Fucking going whether you want to or not. You damn right he was, buddy. <laughs> and I think he's shaking that off as a shoot. You know, I think he hit the back of his head on that one. <laughs> let me just freestyle that Luigi computer science here. <laughs> and this is not normally my deal, but on the bridge. I felt like I noticed that maybe he needed a shirt over at LoisRules.com. I don't know if you've seen all the new shirts over there, but, uh, it felt like maybe he had a low key, big hog. I don't know if that's for me to say or not, but, uh, well, he's taking a pretty good, taking a pretty good look at it right now. As a matter of fact, in his tights, uh, yes, LoisRules.com. I, I must say we just finished up, uh, thanks to the black Friday sale, our biggest month ever of LoisRules.com. And uh, as we get towards the uh, holiday season, either being Christmas or uh, Chinooka, uh, then you may want to give a gift. For Motherfucker, your- did you just say Chinooka? <laughs> Hanukkah is what I meant. I have a lot of Jewish friends. Do you know? One of them is a- do you know that I'm uh, I'm dating a Jewish girl? Did you know? Are that? you really? Yeah. Holy smokes. I'm not exactly sure. I guess I got to get one of those candle gimmicks. I'm a Southern Baptist and I'm out of the loop, but, uh, I've been doing some research and and I think I'm going to be lighting a menorah. Yeah, that's, that's tremendous. I've got a lot of friends who are of the Jewish faith and, uh, we always give each other a hard time. They give me a hard time about being a a Catholic Italian and I give them a hard, a hard time about being Jewish. So, so anyway, uh, you can get it for Hanukkah. You can get it for Christmas for your for your favorite uh, wrestling fan on your list. We've got so many to choose from. Uh, obviously, the, still the biggest seller is Tommy Young by far. And I'd like to say, even though some people down in Houston, Texas, may be pissed off at us, one of our biggest sellers is Suckers Got the No. Yeah, suckers got to know, and suckers got to know that we are smarter than you for putting them up for sale. One in a one cap. I should mention so, that um, these shirts are a constant topic of debate in my world because my circle of friends have really strong feelings about what the best shirts are and what the worst shirts are. So if you had to pick right. like your, your top three favorite shirts that we offer over at LoisRules.com, what would they be? Okay, mine would be Tommy Young. Okay. Uh, Bill's Glass Bottom Boat Tour. That's a good one. And Lois Rules. Those would be my three. See, I'm going a different way with you. I um, I enjoy the damn I am good. Okay. 
I, I really dig the Loki Big Hog. Right. And I think I might actually like Cat Bath as my number three. <laughs> but if I couldn't pick that one, I would I would go hashtag NFLTG because nobody, and I mean nobody, is going to know what that is. Smarten everybody up. What is hashtag NFLTG? Uh, it stands for no fucks left to give. And if you're all basically- out... Go pick them up, yep. lowestrules.com, and uh, Tony's going to give you a call. And if you want to give the coolest Christmas present ever, put your friend's phone number in, and then Tony is going to call your friends. Of course, uh, Japan gets the big win there. They're going to be taking on the Steiner brothers. We've got an interview with Doom. Tony, take it over. Yeah, he starts to say, Hope we don't play that, which was Teddy Long and I's uh, little uh, homage to uh, In Living Color we both loved. Teddy was, uh, of course, in the WWE Hall of Fame. Really, one of the great talkers. Teddy done it all, man. So I want to say right now that the Horseman, you got Ron Simmons here. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to eat myself up some full Horseman. And before, as you can see, Teddy Long has got the four udders down that you can milk if you like. And uh, Teddy and uh, Ron Simmons and uh, Hacksaw Butch Reed. I thought it was a great tag team uh Conrad, didn't you? I did. I have to say, I remember them more under hoods when they had woman with them than I right. do here with uh, Teddy Long. And I know we've mentioned this before, but I have to mention it every time. One of these tag team titles that everybody held, the Horseman, Doom, Rock and Roll Express, Midnight Express, the Road Warriors, everybody. Uh, Dave Milliken actually owns one of these, the actual belt, not a replica, but the belt. And you can see it over on his Twitter at Dave Milliken. If you'd like to see one of those belts that are on TV right now in their current state in 2017. Well, let me ask you this. You know, there was <laughs> Teddy. I love Teddy. Well, there was, uh, the old, uh, world tag team championship belts from the Crockett days back in the seventies and eighties that the Andersons had, do you know where those reside? Um, the national tag team titles, no world tag team championship. I do not, but I'm sure Dave does. I, what do you think of this Lex Luger firework display? And how would you describe the picture of him above his head? Uh, that looked like a velvet Elvis impersonation of Lex Luger is basically what that is, but it's got like some sort of sequin deal in it or something who made yeah. that. I mean, how much do you think Jim Hart wasted on that? Wow. And, and talk to me in terms of stuffed crust pizza. How many of those? Okay. Okay. Uh, he probably played a lot as, uh, and, uh, that probably was part of the, uh, pyro, uh, people heard probably said, uh, along with a pyro, can you give me something special, something different, something caricatures to make these guys seem bigger than life? Yes, we can. And we can have a, a good picture of Lex Luger there as well. As far as the stats are concerned, uh, Luger, because of his look, we mentioned it many times. Not to shit on Lex, but Luger, because of his look, was over. And that's really, Lex was not a good worker. Lex was not a good talker. But Lex had that phenomenal look. And the stand was coming out here, spitting tobacco juice on the fans, which I thought it was wonderful. And I also wondered this. <clears throat> did uh, Conrad, did you ever, growing up, try to chew tobacco? No, I've never tried. Uh, I, I had a lot of friends who did and several threw up. And then of course yeah. a handful of my friends actually did and still to this day, but my parents were yeah. smokers. So I was very anti all tobacco products very early. Yeah. So yeah. I'm 36. I've never tried a dip and I've never tried a cigarette and I don't plan on changing either one. Well, my parents were smokers too. So I've, I've never really, I've never smoked, but, uh, I, I did try some chewing tobacco sometime and try some dip sometime and it is, uh, it is vile and I cannot imagine a guy trying to wrestle and sweat with that. Now he's going to spit most of it out, but he still has all that shit in his mouth and going down his throat. See, he took most of it out right there. I cannot see how you could work with that stuff in your mouth. Well, I mean, that's what. Blew me away about Stan Hansen. It is a great gimmick because there's nobody else doing it. And so, yes, it's gross. It's disgusting. It's nasty, Mm -hmm. but he's a heel. So it really works for all that. Right now, uh, as Jim Ross would go on to say, 
uh, Luger was <laughs> selling like an auctioneer here because when Stan Hansen first hit him with that lariat, Luger all of a sudden realized, what the hell have I gotten myself into here? Because Stan was laying him in. And of course, Luger does that pose, which was a terrible pose. Let me ask you this. Is this the puniest rope in the history of these style matches? Like this looks like something right. you tie down a couch on the back of a fucking Tacoma. It doesn't yeah, look you like a, a, a professional wrestling bull rope. Well, here's what it was. Uh, they said, first of all, we're not using the cowbells. Right. Uh, because they, well, what happened was Stan didn't have his rope with him. And so we said, uh, well, here, we got that match tonight. Will somebody go out and get ourselves a bull rope? And this is what they came up with at the Lowe's in St. Louis. God. WCW, WCW buddy. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what it was. And you're right. It looks like, looks like shit because the, the old bull rope, the regular bull rope, right? It's huge. And it has leather, uh, leather cuffs on it. To cuff yourself, but you and know it's got what? I'm, I'm okay with no bell and no leather. If they just would have yeah. had a thicker rope, but this, this looks like fucking furniture ties for when you help your buddy move into his new apartment. But come on, where are you going to get a bull rope on a Sunday in St. Louis, Missouri? Oh, Jimmy Suzuki cameraman went down. Well, you know, I was just thinking maybe if we're advertising a bull rope match that somebody might, you know, have a bull rope did not. So did you guys have to source the cage the same day as well? Did you guys show up and be like, well, let's run down to Lowe's and get us a steel cage. Yes. And we also made a call to Kansas city. He said, anybody got a fucking ring? (laughs) (laughs) You laugh. No, no, I do laugh because I've, I've actually talked to, um, believe it or not, I've had the same conversation with Rick when he would talk about wrestling matches with no ring, they get there and there's no ring. So they just have to improvise. Yeah. Did he ever tell you the story? And this is about the time that Reed, uh, flair was born. The story about us doing a TV taping in Cincinnati one time and the ring broke. No. Yeah. The ring broke and they did everything they could to fix it. And we ended up, uh, everybody left the Cincinnati gardens that night. Everybody was booing and there was really nothing we could do. And we were there for a TV taping and, uh, it was one of the worst nights I ever remember. Just terrible. So I've, oh, <laughs> I guess Lex wouldn't go over that time or wouldn't go back with him because he tried to pick Lex up and they both fell down together. And they, they used to say that in a match like this, that, uh, that Stan Hansen was so blind that you had to point him to where the ring uh, corner was. And if you ever see any interviews that Stan does any shooting interviews that he does, you can tell they has real thick glasses on. Well, you so. don't need those thick glasses to see a great deal over at $8.com and just in time for Christmas. I mean, all these really fine gifts for the ladies in your life and you're doing it on a budget. It's going to look like you spent a lot more than you actually did over at $8.com. That's the number $8.com. Now remember touching all four corners. Well, oh, and he's hanging him up to dry here. Now this is, uh, uh, this is pretty much of a shoot right here. Did you ever find out if Lex Luger was really hung? <laughs> Never did. I, I think he was hung right there though. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, again, Stan had worked a lot in Japan, so he's very used to that. As they say, strong style. I don't even know if that was a catchphrase back then or not. No, back then it was called beating the fuck out of each other. Yeah, exactly. It's what it was. So he was used to that. So I have a feeling some of the things that he did, uh, you know, I've heard some interviews that Stan has done since then. Stan, uh, doesn't really bury anybody. Uh, I mean, he'll, he'll be honest, but he's pretty good guy, but I have a feeling back then he did not appreciate Lex Luger too much. You know, it, it's one of those deals where I've always kind of got the impression that Stan Hansen was a bit of a loner. Who did Stan run with in the bank? Oli was his friend and Oli ran with nobody. So yeah, he was a loner. And again, Stan, you know, Stan was a, Stan was more of one of these guys, you know, Stan was the guy that broke Bruno San Martino's neck, right? Right. With the Lariat. That's right. Okay. 
So, so Stan was like one of those, like, uh, back then, like those, uh, well, I guess I could consider him like a dusty Rhodes. He would come in and out of a territory and wouldn't stay in a territory for long, kind of an added attraction. So he had been all over. I, I, I liked him. I, I liked his interviews. I, I liked everything about him. I thought he was tremendous. You know, I got to say, I know I'm going to get lots of hate tweets over this, but uh, as a kid, well, man, I, I loved Lex Luger here. I thought Lex Luger was positioned. Well, there's that tobacco that he threw out by the steps there. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. I, and I've always enjoyed the Stan Hansen Lex Luger matches because it's very much a clash of styles. You know, one guy is a badass, legit brawler. And the other guy is a power guy. But you know, really wants no part of brawling, uh, but it's not like he can be very technical either. And I, and I thought it was an interesting match and it probably helps that I'm a big fan of this. Let's touch all four corners. I think it adds another layer of psychology that really helps a guy like Lex Luger. Yeah. And I agree with everything you say now, how old were you back then at this time? At this time I would have been nine years old and Lex okay, Luger so- was super fucking cool. And that's because of the look. Sure. And it, yeah. And, and there you see the fans standing up and they are responding to Luger as well. Yeah. A lot of the fans got into Lex Luger, you know, I mean, we, we, we're sitting here in 2017, looking back on the fact that Luger was not the greatest talker in the world and probably was not the greatest worker in the world, but to the young fans back then, he was like sting super cool. So who are, who are we to say that he wasn't that good? Let me ask you a real question. I'm not trying to be funny. I know we have a lot of fun with this character, but I just want to pretend that that doesn't exist for a minute. Real question. If Tom Zink had blonde hair, could Tom Zink have been Lex Luger? Uh, I know. I don't think so. Really? Yeah. To me, those guys there, it seems like there's very little difference between the two. Uh, except I would say that Zink is actually a better in ring performer. And I just always was curious. In a different time, if there wasn't a, if Lex Luger didn't exist, could Tom Zink have been Lex Luger? That's a great point. But the only thing I can say to that is that I thought, and we saw Tom Zink earlier, we had a great body. I don't think anybody had the body that Luger had. Well, I, I don't disagree with that. So when, when they both exist, then yes, Luger has the upper hand, but if Luger didn't exist, wouldn't Zink have been the most Jack dude here? Yeah, uh, one would think. But, you know, besides besides Sid, yeah, besides Sid and Scott Steiner, I'm just saying there's a lot of similarities, at least for me, between the two, in that both got over based on a look more so than a combination of that with other things. Luger pulling on to Stan Hansen. The fans are really into it. One more corner. Randy Anderson trying to get in between them there, trying to make sure he's close enough to the corner. Boy, great anticipation here. Great reaction from Randy Anderson. This is an exciting moment. And the fans know that Luger is wanted, but down goes the referee. Down goes the referee. Down go. What's this in the ring? Was that the U.S. belt? No, that's Stan Hansen's boot. He just kicked it off and knocked the shit out of Luger. Wow, did he ever? Yes, that's exactly what it was. (laughs) <laughs> the boot and he nailed Luger with the fans know that Luger has won it, but now Hanson, wait a second. I like the finish of this one. Going to wake the referee up and make sure he's conscious to see the mm-hmm. finish here. Yep. Really good so, story, man. I, I really dig the way this was done. Yep. Here comes Nick Patrick in Nick goes one. And now the fans are thinking, wait a minute, Luger's going to get screwed. Look at him standing at ringside. Two. Right now, Stan Hansen is checking with Nick Patrick, make sure he knows where the third corner is. So Nick did not see Luger make the the touch of corner, of corner number four. There's three. And the fans cannot believe what they're about to see. Luger is going to be screwed out of the U S title and Randy Anderson on the other end, really selling this pulling himself up at the same time that Stan Hansen is trying to pull Luger over Luger fighting off Luger did a, you know, for all the shit we, or at least I've heaped on Lex Luger as far as work rate did a great job in this. Wow. Down he goes again. 
and that's it. Nick Patrick comes in, says, bring the bell, and Stan Hansen will retain the U.S. title. Look at the crowd, man, right- all like swinging their arms left and right, like, no. Yeah. But now, Randy, look at the fans react to this. Randy Anderson Huge says, reaction. wait a second. I saw Luger make the tag onto the fourth corner. Luger sends Stan Hansen out. The fans are going crazy. And Lex Luger is your new United States heavyweight champion. Uh, I would say one of the best matches on the card, wouldn't you? I, I really enjoyed it. And I know people are going to, you know, send your hate tweets to, hey, hey, it's Conrad. But I'll just love their feud here. Of course, Hanson won the U.S. title from Lex at Halloween Havoc. He sort of came in out of nowhere and quickly won the title. And now he's dropped it back here at Starcade. And, um, of course, somewhere in the match here, Paulie said there's no way Lex was going to beat Hanson in a Texas Lariat match, which lets you know, well, he's probably definitely winning. Uh, and, and this wasn't a Dusty finish because Dusty's not here. And the guy actually left with the title. Uh, Wade Keller gave it uh, three stars and called it a good, violent bull rope match. I really I dug think. it. Yep. I agree with Wade. I agree with you. <clears throat> Let me say this. Uh, why would anyone send anybody hate tweets? I mean, I, 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 uh, troll on ES about ESPN all the time, but why would anybody send another person Call, hate tweets? Do this interview for us. Ah, whoa. All right. Let me say this. Jim Ross, I've been blown sky high before. I also know that I got my ass kicked, but well, he's out of breath. So fuck him. Now let's go back to the ring. And here is Gary, Michael Capetta. I love the way you made Michael a little more country than you normally would since it's JR. That's how JR would call him. He would say Michael. Gary, Michael Capetta. Um, Wade wrote that Lex's interview was good, short and high energy. And he wrote, yeah, it showed how much further Lex had come along than sting had in that department. Do you think that wow. Lex was a better promo at this point than, uh, no. Okay. No, look at the uh, portraits back there of Arn Anderson and Rick Flair. I wonder where those are. Do you think that, uh, Beth Flair has that portrait of Rick in her garage or something like that? Beth Flair does. I'm just asking, do you think she does? She may have it on the floor and be parking the cars on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's so awesome. That's that could be it. Uh, different horseman music four horseman shirt. Uh, we did uh, a lot of, uh, uh, we did a lot. I thought we did a pretty good job. We, you saw the doom shirts, right? Right. Uh, and we got four horsemen shirts and after this show is over, we're also going to, uh, invite you to, uh, to buy a t-shirt. I don't know why we didn't ask fans to buy a t-shirt. There are sting shirts. Why we didn't ask fans to buy a t-shirt during the course of the show. We just did it during the credits at the end of the credits. I, I don't get that. Well, because WCW was, uh, not ran yeah. for profit at this point. And it's interesting what matches get this, uh, portrait treatment because so far we've seen it for Lex Luger. We saw it for Arn and Rick, and now we've got it for doom. Uh, what do you think the, uh, Butch Reed portrait would sell for on eBay today? Uh, Butch Reed would probably sell for nine ninety five on eBay. Uh, I think that's a little high. I'm thinking more like $8.com. <laughs> uh, I thought, uh, man, I, a doom badass team. If you'd like to see that, uh, uh Butch Reed portrait. Uh, it's over at eight dollars.com right now. That's the number eight dollars.com. Okay. And of course, as you might imagine, Simmons, a four time all American nose tackle at Florida state. Do we run that in the ground or what? Here's what I enjoyed. Huh. The, the, the stat, the infographic for doom, the picture was not of the guys. It's of the fucking manager peanut head. I know. And that's because when we were taking those pictures, doom was not at the arena as of yet. And we had to get them in. So let's go ahead and run with that. So there you go. Peanut head was the man. And now we're going to see, uh, tape fist here. Arn Anderson. If I take the belt off, hypothetically, if I told you that in this match, there are four hall of famers, would you ever guess that butch Reed wouldn't be in, but Teddy Longwood? 
Yeah, no, not at all. But it's not saying that Teddy's not deserving, but I, I agree with you. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean that anybody is deserving or isn't deserving. I just think it's worth mentioning. Yeah. All right. So meanwhile, as Butch Reed is laying it in here, Barry Windham in the ring with Ron Simmons. Oh, with Butch Reed. I'm sorry. Pretty violent match. Going to be a real shitty finish here. And a lot of juice, which fans in the St. Louis area and everywhere loved. There's Barry sawing away right now, I do believe. This, this match only goes seven minutes. Uh, so hmm. for such a, a heated deal and blood, uh, yep. seven minutes doesn't seem like a lot of time, but you should remember because of this tournament, it's hard to imagine. We've got 14 matches here uh, yeah, and, no. the, and the fans live were actually treated to a dark match. Do you remember what the dark match was? No. What was the dark match? Uh, Bill Irwin beat TC Carter. What's your favorite TC Carter match? Uh, I don't, uh, it was probably that dark match that I didn't see. I, I never watched. I don't think I ever watched a dark match ever. Really? Yeah. I don't think I ever, uh, the, if, if I was not involved in the match or there was not a match I had to commentate on or had to talk about, I don't think I ever watched one. So that may change. Uh, in the coming weeks with MLW TV, but I don't know. <clears throat> Are there four better workers that you could have in a match here? I mean, Butch Reed was, was over like Rover long time, uh, top star in the different territories. Of course, Ron Simmons is going to become world champion soon. Barry Windham would go on to be world champion. Arn Anderson, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. What a squad of talent you guys have in the same ring here. Absolutely. Uh, can I ask a question? They're going to say Tony Schiavone doesn't remember shit. Who's the guy, the, the big guy down the bottom left-hand corner? It's not Teddy Long. Let me look here. All right, there, there's a guy. <laughs> sorry. if you There he is. See the bottom of your screen right now with a towel around his neck? Tony, you don't remember who that is, really? No. Do you know who it is? Come on. <laughs> I don't and apparently it's not important because we haven't shown him at all. We haven't put a camera on him at all. Is that JYD? <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell is that? <laughs> what the hell? Send your tweets to at Tony Schiavone, 24. <laughs> what oh, oh, what a tremendous, tremendous one, two, only got a two count. That time. Who is that? You don't even know yourself. That's why you're, that's why you're giving me shit. Dude. Come on. <laughs> dude, don't dude. Come on me. <laughs> oh, a knee to the back of Eric. Oh boy. These guys are working hard for seven minutes, man. You know, I, that, that's worth mentioning. I feel like they're trying to pull out all the stops here. Cause there's, there's lots of high spots here. I mean, the blood and everything else, there's a lot going on. Yeah. And remember, no disqualification. Wait a minute, there's a guy on the. Oh, okay, I get it now. These are, these are medical. <laughs> these are, these are medical attendants. I saw the guy on the other side. I got it now. Okay, these are medical attendants that obviously are not going to stop the match because of blood. They're going to keep it going on. These are See, these are they're, they're cut okay. men, okay, and they're, they're working on each men. other in the middle of the match. And you're out here saying, "Is that JYD?" I don't know. The, it was a big burly guy. I don't, I, I don't know who it was, but they are cut men working on cuts, <laughs> which is what cut men do. <laughs> a big up. What a, a top to, rope suplex. I got to tell you as a kid, he's the first yeah. guy I ever saw do a suplex off the top rope. And I thought it was Windham? such a cool move. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, I can't remember. I can't remember who I saw do the first top rope suplex. Big shoulder block off the top by Hacksaw Butch Reed. And now Wyndham's going to shove a guy out. And a double team. All right, so we got cut men. All right, then. 
Well, I don't know why they got cut, man, is they, they stop one bleeding. They're going to cut themselves again. It's a gimmick. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. I got to, sometimes you got to, got to, you know, kind of go with the flow and think it's real. <laughs> and who, who is uh, that? Who is that guy in the ring who looks like a young Kenny powers? Does anybody <laughs> even know? <laughs> How about Arn Anderson sell in the chair? It's so hilarious. <laughs> no. Arn was tremendous. Oh, God. Uh, oh, boy. Pile driver. On a giant yeah. Barry Windham. Yeah. Now, we're, get, we're getting close to the finish here, and, and the finish is going to be one of these convoluted finishes to where the announcers never know who – and this is one of the, this is really fucked up. The announcers never know who won the match. So Jim Ross is going to end up saying, I guess doom won it. And I guess doom are still world tag team champs. This was really messed up. And this was a case of where the announcers and this as an announcer, a lot of times you really got ticked off about it. The announcers were never told what to say or told what the finish was going to be. Cause if they were, they could have certainly. They could have certainly sold the fact that doom won it because what we're going to have here in just a few moments is a double count. See right here, Nick's looking one, two, three. So who won? Nick doesn't know. And the battle goes on and they will fight on the back. And then Jr. will say, I guess doom still retain the world tag team titles where you can see that Butch Reed did kick out, Arn Anderson stayed down, so Doom wins the title. You can see that on the replay, but no one explained anything to us. So I, I guess the, the factor here is that you saw a great violent match. Does it really matter who won the titles or not, right? I mean, would that be it here? Yeah, I mean, to me, it was uh, it was a brawl that I wanted to see, and there's four right. four badasses. And yeah. the, and the, the tag titles were almost secondary to the violence at this point to me. What yeah, a bump yeah, to right. take on the ramp like that. Absolutely. One after you're another. There for the, you're there for the action. You don't care who wins or loses. And right now the announcers are, but, but, but still, you know, you try to get as, as announcers and, and I felt for Jim here, you try to get things right. Uh, and you, you, because if you don't get things right, they're going to, you know, claim that you're a dumbass. You try to get things right, and you can only go so far based on what you're told or not told here. What do you think of the ramp? It's a pretty controversial deal amongst wrestling fans. Some fans love it. Some fans hate it. What's Tony think? Don't like it. Not at all. I fucking love it. I think it's awesome. Yeah, I knew, I knew you did. I, I don't care much for that multicolored star there either. I don't know who came up with that shit. That was uh, done at the last minute as well. See, Jr. here is going to Jr. is mad. Watch, he's going to call Paul stupid. <laughs> this uh, Jr. is mad as right here. Uh, go back and listen to this, fans. Jr. is angry as a shoot because he wasn't told what's going to happen or what should be done or what he should say. So he called Paulie stupid. <laughs> I, I was I was laughing in the backstage area on this. So they're going to go back and show the replay again. And here's what we're talking about. It's pretty apparent that the doom is going to retain the world tag team championship. Here's why there's a roll up by Wyndham and there goes Ron Simmons one, two, and Butch Reed kicks out in three, but Arn Anderson does not get up. So uh, it's apparent that doom retains the world tag team championship, but no one let Jr. know what and the fuck was going on. So he was angry <laughs> and he called, he called Paul E stupid there. And that was a, that was a great shooting moment because Jim was really, really pissed. <laughs> and Paul, he couldn't believe he called him stupid because that wasn't, that was not part of what they were stupid. What the fuck? He called me stupid before. Oh, speaking of stupid, we want you to get inside the steel cage and check my midsection. It is expanded. That's right. It's Russell war 91 coming up in February. I'll be in a softball tournament. That's exactly right. The steel cage is being built for one of the biggest cluster fucks off forever. Sunday, February 24th, live in Phoenix, Arizona. Call your local cable operator for availability. It sucks. 
Why did they run the same commercial in the pay-per-view twice? But look at this. You see those three letters in front of you on the screen right there? You know, here's something w- that a lot of people have always wanted to know. A lot of people have said, why were the letters crooked? And I've always said it was a design element. It was done on purpose, but yeah. they think, oh, they couldn't even get their logo straight, which has just made me laugh that people think that this was an accident. Chat me up about this set. Is this something that, uh, uh, David Crockett put together? Yeah. David Crockett, uh, did, uh, I mean, he didn't design it himself, but David Crockett, you know, had people design it and approved the design of it. I, I liked it. I, I think it was a, had a unique look to it. I mean, if you look up in the corner of the building, WCW logo was always kind of tilted to the side. So this was a very unique logo. I don't think it was, I don't think WC <laughs> look, we were screwed up. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I know I've, I've been, uh, craw- caught on the carpet by saying the F bomb too many times. So I'll just say we were screwed up. Whoa, whoa, I know. whoa, whoa, whoa. What the fuck are you doing? Don't you change our show because some jack off on Twitter took you to task. If they don't like the language on the show, go listen to the JJ fucking Dylan podcast. It's uh it's the NyQuil of podcasting. There's no cursing, but there's no entertainment either. It's the JJ Dylan show right here at MLWradio.com. Now back to whatever the fuck you were saying. Okay. So people may thought we were, uh, fucked up and we were fucked up, but come on. We, we all realize the logo was crooked and we liked it that way. All right. Pat O'Connor Memorial international tag team tournament finals. Thank God. Are coming up <laughs> the USA against Japan and let's ring the bell. And we probably should have a pretty good matchup here. One that, uh, certainly, uh, will hopefully put it, put, uh, the other matches out of our memory. Scott Steiner trying to get the fans behind him. Fans are kind of buying into it. Uh, and you know, if you think about it here, we just saw a pretty violent tag team match. Absolutely. Right. So how do you follow up that? If you're the Steiners, uh, and if you're, uh, if you're, uh, Sato and, uh, and Muda, well, you, you slow things down a little bit, which is what they're doing right now. And you start from scratch. I think it's pretty good psychology on, on all their parts, but Muda's not, not buying into that at all. Wow. Would you call that an enziguri kick? Look at you showing off the skills. Thank you very much. You know, MLW TV is warm me up again. By the way, I, I'm working with Rich Bokini. You do know that, don't you? On MLW.TV? Yeah. And Rich said, I'm so sorry that you and Conrad are, are pissed off at me. Uh, and uh, for uh, and and uh, I, I want to let you know that I, I, I respect. I said, Rich, shut the fuck up. Okay? Shut the fuck up. Um, I'm not mad at Rich at all. I'm not mad at Rich at all. He doesn't, I told him rich. I said, we're having fun. Yeah. Everybody needs to stop taking everything. So fucking seriously. We're we're, and you know, rich, we're having fun. And if you align yourself with a boring old fuck, it's your fault. You know, I mean, mean, pick a better broadcast partner. I mean, you could have picked anyone from wrestling's history and you put JJ fucking Dylan like, right. Yeah. Ask him about his, his minute bucket sack of nuts, but he won't. No, or okay. the Caesar salad at uh, Caesar's Palace, and he'll break it down. Exactly. Right. Hey, he won't. He'll ask him about when he was booking. Uh, uh, oh, look at that. Great duck. Oh, and a clothesline. Man, tremendous stuff. And here is Mr. Sato. Why, why does Ole Anderson not have a podcast? I feel like we need to do a live show near Ole Anderson just so they can wheel him out and him motherfuck you again like it's 1985. Uh, you don't want that, I don't think. Why? Because God bless him. I'm not so sure. I I would get, I may be wrong. And of course, the last time I saw him was a couple of years ago, but I think we would get about 10 minutes into the Ole Anderson podcast with me. And you would realize that he didn't know who I was. That's not surprising. He only remembers the big stars. <laughs> down go Steiner ducks down. Oh, how about Rick Snyder didn't throw many drop kicks. How about, how about this? It looked pretty fucking good too. You damn right. He did. Scott did. Rick did a lot of those, as you saw, clotheslines right now, but, uh, he threw a drop kick there. Wow. You know, when I see one of these matches, Oh, I, I'm, I, I think again, and I know it's something we've touched on many times. I'm thinking why in the world did we break up the Steiner brothers? No, I totally agree. You know, one of the things Jesus. that I found interesting there 
is Muda was up top and had to make himself wobble because they were waiting on him to jump. And when he starts to wobble, Rick's like, oh, fuck, that means I'm supposed to shake the rope. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, Mr. Sato say shake hand. Oh, oh, fuck you. I ain't shaking your hand, dude. Uh, there's rumor in innuendo that the Steiners would not only rough up the enhancement talent, but they'd rough up some guys in the back. And, uh, allegedly, according to a friend of ours, they were brutal to Bush Reed and, uh, our mutual friend asked Ron Simmons, Hey man, the way the Steiners just fucking run over Butch Reed. W- why don't they bully you that way? Why don't they fuck with you? And yeah. according to the legend, Ron Simmons says I'm unfuck <laughs> And I don't know why, but I think unfuck withable would be no, one of our number one shirts over at lowestrules.com. I would agree. And I could see, I could see Ron saying that and I could see Ron not being or being that way. Unfuck withable. Oh, belly to belly. Down he goes. Uh, a, a Snyder story that I may not have told here. I think I told the story about, I know I was told the story about Oliver and them shaving off his eyebrows and putting swastikas on his head. Uh, we had a promoter named Chip Burnham. Uh, Chip recently passed away uh, within the last year. Chip was a good guy, liked Chip a lot, but Chip liked screwing around with Scott and Rick Steiner. He was just a he was a he was kind of a friendly guy, and he liked kidding around. He always joked around with me, and we would tell him, you know, don't joke around with the Steiners because they will do things to you joking around that they think's funny, and most people don't, right? So they took. Uh, as legend has it, uh, they, uh, tied up chip one time, uh, with, uh, duct tape in his hands. Okay. Uh, and duct tape his hands together, uh, duct tape, his feet together, pulled down his pants to the bottom of his ass and stuck about three or four Sharpies up his ass after a show one night. is right. I also had heard, and I never asked Jr. this story. I also had heard that, that Jr. had gone to Augusta, Georgia, uh, to a WWE event. This is when he was one of his first WWE events and the Steiners. I think the Steiners win the WWE at that time. And the Steiners, uh, uh, flatten all four of his tires. Did you ever hear that story? Uh, I have heard that story. Yeah. Did they also mess up his car or just, uh, flatten his tires? I heard they did something to his car. Yeah. I, I thought I heard, I think I heard the, uh, four flat tires before. Hey, who threw yeah. uh, Rick Steiner, his uh, headpiece there? I don't know. I was, I was, it, it just I was fly, in the midst of it flies in anecdote. off camera. Yeah. Um, that's who it was. what was that? He hit him. Oh, he hit him with the, the bell. Wow. How about that? So anyway, what, what I'm saying is, is based on that story about Jr. and the story about Oliver, our German announcer, the story about Chip Burnham, don't, don't, don't start screwing around with the Steiners because their, their sense of playing a practical joke on you is a little bit more lethal than we're used to. Right. Who, um, who was more of a hard ass Rick or Scott, as far as ribbing guys goes. Oh, Rick Steiner was, because he thought everything, he thought everything was funny. That's why it blows me away that he's on a school board right now. <laughs> if I re- remember some of the shit that he did and he's on a school board, yikes, mighty. He's the same guy that stuck three Sharpies up a guy's ass. Okay. Up on top. It's Mr. Sato down across the shoulder. Well, that time Muda missed an elbow, I guess. And now chokehold here. How different is this, uh, matchup? From the one we saw them in a couple of weeks ago against another Japanese tag team. Yeah, this is, uh, that one against the other tag team was like more like suplex city. Wasn't it? Can I use that term? Yeah, you can. And, uh, I don't know if you saw, but I believe you are the the creator of suplex city and you might be do a royalty or two from WWE Brock Lesnar and uh, Paul Heyman, because I saw on Twitter recently where. Uh, Sonny Ono or Jimmy Hart or somebody, there was a manager on nitro suplex from the outside to the inside in like 1995 or 1996. 
and you called it suplex city. Wow. Maybe I should send a, uh, email to uh, triple H say, where's my money. Um, let's, let's create what you think that might sound like. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. I'll, I'll, I'll start typing. Okay. As we do it. All right, let me go. You open up a word document here. Dear. Oh, I'm Paul. In, I'm in, I mean, I assumed you would actually call them. Not no, I'm no, 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 no. You, you do it. Email. Hope you're well. How is Stephanie? How pissed off were you to see Shane come back? Ha 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 ha. By the way, I started Suplex City back in the 90s, and I understand Brock Lesnar is doing it. I would like uh, <clears throat> uh, some royalties from the network for that, or at least a lifetime supply of Jimmy John's. Uh, my best to you. Please respond. If not, go fuck yourself. Your friend, Jim Ross. It would be something like that. And I'm going to hit send. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think? You think that would be, uh, you think he was, you think his email is, uh, H H H at WWE.com or Paul Levesque at, uh, I don't know. He uh, probably doesn't have an email. I think it's probably favorite son at WWE.com. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, how great would it be if it really was the game at WWE court.com? <laughs> that would be tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. You know what? I'm going to fucking do it. I'm going to send an email right now. The Are you really? Game <laughs> at WWE Corp. Okay. All right. Test. See if it comes back to you. <laughs> this is a test. Not Stephanie's <laughs> ex-husband. <laughs> no. Hope, not that one. I hope you guys are enjoying this match as we uh, do some emailing to the people, the WWE. Yeah. It's worth mentioning that we've got, uh, the Steiner brothers and the great fucking mood holy shit. That kick was right in the face. Yes, it was. Um, and instead we're sending emails to triple H. Yeah. By um, the way, I, you did, know, I, I should mention, I did not get a bounce back. Okay, good. <laughs> it might actually be his email. <laughs> what did you say? Well, look, let me say this. Can I say this? Everybody, all of our slap dicks out there. And you, Conrad, don't they realize the WWE network, what we have meant to them as far as downloads are concerned? I think they have to. Don't they get it? In 2017, more people watch the WWE network than ever before. And I think a lot of that is because of us right here, right? There's no question. One, two, three. There's your finish. I think our just really cool finish. Four stars, according to the torch and Wade Keller. What'd you think, man? Yeah, I think it was, uh, had I been paying attention to it and not sending out emails, I probably would have agreed. Well, we're coming up on my favorite part. Of course, yeah. that referee, you should mention to everybody who that referee is in real life. I, I don't uh, tell me who it is. I don't see him right now. Uh, he was, uh, the guy who booked everybody for new Japan and probably put all this shit together. Okay. Um, anyway, he, spike he was that driver guy. there and, uh, look at that kick, man. Yeah, that was, that was solid. That was fucking legit. And this is a fun finish here. Super old school sunset flip off the top onto Mr. Saito. One, two, three Steiner brothers get the win and uh, earn the trophy and the title of your tournament champions. And the highlight of the show is coming up boys and girls. Absolutely. It's a Steiner promo. Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. Do you want to try to do this one? I mean, if you get time, you should go watch this with the sound on, but Tony, yeah, let's hear the, t- the Shivani version here. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim Ross and Paulie dangerously. We're here with Scott and Rick Steiner winning the first annual and to be the only Pat O'Connor Memorial, uh, championship, uh, tournament. And I like to acknowledge Pat O'Connor's family over here to my left. There they are. Do we get a camera shot of them? Can we, can we get a camera? Can we get a fucking camera shot? Of, what the, oh, we'll just wave at him. Jesus Christ. We can't even get a camera shot up. All right, Scott, uh, you have won this championship, but before we bring you in, let's bring in Mr. Jim Hurd. Jim, thank you very much, Tony. With the exception of the goddamn candy man and the hunchback and the ding dongs and, uh, peg leg Jack. I want to say Scott and Rick Steiner are some of the greatest workers I've ever been around in my life. 
I'd also say to you, the nature boy, Ric Flair, fuck you. I don't like you. Jim Cornette, I don't like you. And I also like to say, yeah, okay. I'd also like to say, I'm glad to be back in St. Louis. I know there is a lot of people who would love to tie me, hog tie me, and make me stay in St. Louis, but I'm going to go back to Atlanta on the plane with everybody else. Scotty. Thank you, Mr. Jim Hurd. Uh, Scotty, congratulations. Hi, Tony. I'd like to say it. Uh, and uh, for the guys out there, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, let, uh, for the guys out in, uh, in uh, Kuwait, I'd like to say that we are, uh, I, I, wait a minute. I'm going to say it here in a minute. Well, uh, eat it, Shoney's. Eat it, Shoney's in Ackworth. <laughs> my grand, That's what my I wanted uncle, to say. Both of my uncles, uh, Korea, okay. Vietnam, okay. proud. Okay. Oh, guys, I like to say that. Uh, I go. Oh, woo. there it is. Uh, the Steiners and Jim Hurd. Absolutely. And the best looking one here besides the girls is me. Let's go back to Jim Ross. Jim, I hope your chair is higher than Paulie Dangerously. Jim, take it away. It doesn't get old. It's awesome. <laughs> okay. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the steel cage. All right, Paulie Dangerously. We know I've called you stupid. We know I've been pissed off because they have not told me the finishes of all the matches. But I would like to say we are now going to find out who maybe the Black Scorpion is. Let me say this, Shivani, you can send all the emails you want to Triple H. You are not going to get a lifetime supply of Jimmy Johns. I know because I represent Brock Lesnar. Now let's go back to the ring. Klondike Bill has built ourselves a nice cage. <laughs> Take a look at that fucking cell phone. No, it's not a cell phone. That's a home phone. It's a, it's a cordless phone. This is well before 900 megahertz was a real thing. And, uh, it's a regular fucking cordless phone. Oh. How jacked up low rent was WCW here? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Too much, man. All right. Gary, Michael Capetta in the ring. There you see the steel cage. <clears throat> and now, uh, we introduce, uh, the referee. Uh, Dick, the bruiser, it's worth mentioning that they say he's the world's most dangerous wrestler. Well, if yeah. he's the world's most dangerous wrestler, what is that saying about the other guys in the fucking main event? Well, let's put Dick, the bruiser over because we're in St. Louis, uh, Dick, the bruiser story. If I may, please do, uh, Dick, the bruiser was very instrumental in the career of Bobby, the brain Heenan. Uh, because, you know, they all worked up in the Indiana, Chicago, up in there together. Uh, Bobby did not like Dick the Bruiser at all. Zero. Uh, and <laughs> we were at a wrestling show one time, and a fan, God bless the fan, seemed like a nice guy. He said, Bobby, I've got a, I've got a cassette tape here of you and Dick the Bruiser doing a couple of promos in Chicago. I, this is my gift to you. Bobby said, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we're riding down the road and I put it in and Dick, the bruiser says, we're going to go down to Chicago and we're going to go to Indianapolis and we're going to go and he didn't hit eject and threw the thing out the window. <laughs> and he said, fuck Dick, the bruiser. And he threw it out the window. And I'm thinking that poor guy went to all this trouble of putting that, that cassette uh, tape together for Heenan and he didn't heard Dick the Bruiser's voice and got so pissed off he threw it out the window as we're driving down the interstate. So it's worth mentioning Dick the Bruiser here is only sixty one years old. He would turn sixty two uh, the following June and then pass away in November. So he wouldn't make it to another Starcade. This Starcade and this Black Scorpion angle, I think we can credit with the death of Dick Bruiser. Yeah, of death of a lot of things. Uh, uh, this is uh, isn't this the uh, who are these Black the angel Scorpions? Here? What's that? Who are these Black Scorpions? There's Several black scorpions here and they're, yeah. they're having fun with this saying that, uh, there's been as many black scorpion sightings as there has been Elvis. Do you know who any of these guys under hoods are here? Yeah. The big one is Dave Shelton. Okay. The angel, right? What was he called? The fault, the dark angel or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's the big one. The other guys, I, I'm not so sure where they were. And now what's that? Jim said, what's that hovering overhead? I remember thinking, <laughs> 
that's people leaving. Um, <laughs> this is such a visual here. Um, yeah. And we're going to talk about how this all came together, but this is like a space age version of like if the movie cocoon with the old people and flight of the navigator had a baby, uh, this is the apparatus that it would be. Yes. Yeah. And of course, uh, the, uh, the black scorpions voice sting. All these guys are pretenders. And now I'm going to reveal myself. Uh, by the way, that's the, pretty, uh, that's pretty solid. By the way, that was pretty good. Wasn't, uh, by the way, even the mask. And of course, once the apparatus gets down, if I remember correctly, uh, it's going to go all the way down to the, uh, walkway. And then they are going to have bright lights and smoke and pyro. So Flair can slip in and appear. I know some people in the back probably saw Flair slip in, but of course, for TV's sake, you're not going to see that. Uh, when this opened, and I'm standing, the star on the left, Yep. I'm standing over there somewhere behind the star. So I'm watching and listening. And when this thing opened up, uh, even as much as we attempted to cover up Ric Flair's nose or his beak with this one, no one bought it. When this thing opened up, there were a lot of people that went, woo. Yeah. You can hear the woos in the crowd. Right. And, um, he's saying the other black scorpions have been only messengers. There's only one black scorpion. It is I, and here he is. Right. And it's a different robe than we normally see the nature boy in. And of yes. course the announcers can't wait to start saying, I don't recognize him. Right. But from afar, yeah. why would you, but you guys went. I mean, you spared no expense here on the pod, the pyro, the lights, the fire. This is a big production for WCW at this time, is it not? Yes, it is. Rick had Olivia make this role. Now check out that, that sting mask. I mean, that Scorpion mask, by the way, a uh, Dennis Brent owns that mask. It was signed by Rick flair. Dennis Brent still has it. Uh, and, uh, we should so, mention that the, uh, the, the buildup here. And this is someone from Sting's past, and he's right. mentioned California and Tulsa, and he right. says that uh, he was once his tag team partner, and mm. they sort of referenced this going back to 1986 in Los Angeles because they're trying to make the smart fans believe that Sting might be wrestling the Ultimate Warrior here because those smart right. fans remember that the Ultimate Warrior was a big part of Sting's career early. Now, this is one of my more famous or more, more notable memories of my memory is Sting coming out with the big uh, portrait behind him and this particular look with these tights and that jacket and the big gold belt uh and the nameplate at this time says Stinger. Of course, there was only a handful of nameplates that were made that actually fit on that belt by the original belt makers. They made one for Dusty Rhodes we never saw, one for Ronnie Garvin we never saw, uh one RICK flare and then this one which is stinger, which, uh, was on the cover of the VHS. So there's a little bit of uh, belt trivia for you belt nerds out there. So if, if this is a memorable shot for you, uh, of sting, then we were doing some things correctly back then that we, I guess, kind of failed to capitalize on. Well, I don't know. You know, this doesn't at the time, of course, you guys had more of an adult presentation than compared to the WWF, but this black scorpion thing feels like something from really old school wrestling or some over the top cartoonish stuff. And, and I, I found it funny that flair is trying very hard here to not look like himself with his right. mannerisms and his movements. This was probably a very difficult match for flair to do because after so long of essentially doing the same match or very similar matches, you fall into patterns where it's almost just muscle memory. And you could tell flair's working really hard to not be Ric flair. Yeah, and there you can see a close-up of the mask and how that beak is tucked in and it's still not fooling a lot of people. Of course, you know, there's because of dirt sheets and everything, the word got out it was going to be flare anyway. So, you know, the, the word got around. But, yeah, you're right. And it just goes to show, again, the uh, what an incredible talent the Nature Boy Ric Flair was. Knowing what he had to do and how he had to portray someone else beside himself what he was so accustomed to through all these years. 
It's interesting to me, though, that you guys, you guys did a really big number with Great American Bash 1990 and Sting finally becoming world champion, beating Ric Flair. It feels like you could have just done Starcade 90 in a cage with Sting and Ric Flair, the cage to keep the horsemen out and just go the traditional route. Do you remember how and why the whole Black Scorpion thing came to be? Yes, I do. Uh, Jim Hurd, <laughs> boy, didn't you know you were going to hear that name? Yep. Uh, yeah, Jim Hurd wanted something different than the regular. I mean, the regular thing would be to have a steel cage. You're right, right down the line. I mean, the natural progression is have a match, then maybe have another match, a rematch, then you would go Broadway or something, and then you have to finally go to the cage. I mean, Steamboat and Flair used to do that. Match, uh, Broadway, cage, Broadway in the cage, 90 minutes in the cage, and they would finish at an angle like that. But Jim Hurd didn't want things like that. He wanted something mysterious, something different, something that we could hang our hat on. And this is what Ole Anderson came up with. Uh, and we put a lot of time and effort into that. So yes, to me, and maybe I'm wrong to me, if you ran WCW, you let the bookers do what they freaking want to do and you stay out of it until it gets to the point to where they're no longer doing their job. And then you make a change, but you don't become a booker, especially if you're just, if you don't know what the fuck you're doing and you know, uh, look, Jim Hurd and I got along, but he didn't know what the fuck he was doing. And so this was Jim Hurd inspired coming up with something different, something mysterious. And even though we put a lot of time and effort into it, we did a lot of stumbles along the way. Like remember the magician and black scorpion changing into the tiger and shit like that. That was the mysterious things that were other than pro wrestling. We just wanted to do pro wrestling. He wanted ding dongs, right? He wanted the candy man. He wanted the black scorpion. And this is what he got. Let me ask you this. Did, did anybody else try out to be the voice or was it always going to be and supposed to be Ole Anderson doing the voice? No, it was all, it was always Ole doing the voice. Did you yeah. ever see Ole? I mean, Ole is not known for his sense of humor. Oh yeah. But, uh, <laughs> did Ole do this voice a lot in the back just to fuck with the boys yeah. and have fun with oh, it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Give me an example of a fun Ole Anderson line in that voice. Okay. Sting. You stupid motherfucker. Don't you know, we have no idea where this angle's going. You dumb son of a bitch. Things like that. And we'd always laugh. And you know what? There may be on some, uh, some video cassettes that some, uh, raw video cassettes, uh, that the WWE owns back in the library that that's on there. Cause we used to roll on that shit and only used to make us laugh all the time. With the sting outtakes. We should mention clash of the champions. 12 is where we would see the black scorpion in the ring. He wrestled sting for the world title there. It was Al Perez at the time wrestling as the black scorpion. Uh, Rick flair has said that it was actually supposed to be Al Perez the entire time. But then when Al quit, um, Rick flair sort of was tapped to be the guy here and allegedly Al Perez quit because he didn't want to do the job on a big pay-per-view like this. Is that the story you got? Uh, well, no, that's not the story I got. The story I got was that we had, uh, we had bannered around the idea who is the black scorpion going to be. And no one could decide on who the black scorpion could be. And basically anytime we had somebody come up with an idea of it being the black scorpion, that heard would shit on it. Al Perez. Now what Al Perez is not a big enough name. It's finally to the point to where, as we're going along with this, Flair finally said, fuck it. I'll do it. I'll be the black scorpion. That's what I remember. I don't remember Al quitting because he didn't want to do the job. Could have been a part of it that I was unaware of, but I remember just the lead up to it being like a big cluster. Fuck nobody being able to decide who the black scorpion was going to be because Hurd got a hand in, in all that worth mentioning Al Perez could be the long lost father of Seth Rollins from the WWE. Um, <laughs> so they worked that match at uh, clash of the champions in early September. And then Al actually works as the black scorpion at a house show at the end of September in Chicago. And, uh, during that match, the clash with sting, 
Sting had won the match and he's about to unmask the scorpion. But when he takes off the mask, there's another mask underneath it. When all of a sudden another black scorpion appears on the ramp and, uh, Ole Anderson says the whole thing was sort of a joke just to appease Jim Hurd. Mm, um, probably so. Ole says that Jim Hurd didn't like the cards that Ole had put together and right. uh, felt like they needed something new, just as you said. So Ole says he goes into his office and writes Sting versus the Black Scorpion uh, on a sheet of paper and gives it to Hurd. And Hurd says something like, Now you're learning. Exactly. And uh, Ole says, I didn't even know what the hell a black scorpion was going to be. I had no idea, no idea at all. And, um, Ole says after he left, Dusty took over booking for the angle. When do you remember first hearing about the black scorpion? And, and did you think it would become the fucking main event of Starcade? Yeah, I thought it would become the main event of Starcade because I remember when Ole did that and heard says, Whatever you said, he said, I don't remember what the exact verbiage was, but Ole, Ole, you know, Ole and I were very close back then. And Ole, I, Ole said, he, he likes this stupid shit and we're going to go with it. And, uh, so it, it, it got a life of its own basically. And now, you know, Ole gets the creative juices flowing and, you know, herd likes it. And he just kind of adds on to it each and every week. And each and he, he thinks about it. Well, you know, maybe this is going to work and maybe this is a good idea. And maybe the intrigue of the black scorpion is, you know, worth our time. So it just kind of developed and, and snowballed from there to the point to where the storyline got a little bit bigger than the payoff because we weren't only didn't know who the black scorpion eventually would be. This fact that, Sting, I was uh, with you in Tulsa in California. Yeah, okay. People said maybe that's the Blade Runners, right? Uh, he and the Ultimate Warrior. But I think Ole was just bullshitting through all of this. It's worth mentioning lots of guys actually portrayed the Black Scorpion. Al Perez, Jeff Ellis, Bill Irwin, Dave Sheldon, Stan Payne, Barry Windham, Matt Hunter, Joey Janela, and uh, Randy Colley, uh, Moondog Rex. Yes. Um, so and I Dick, uh, in Houston on September 16th, sting would beat the black scorpion, which was Irwin. And that would continue around the horn until October. And that's when, uh, in Bluefield moon dog Rex would step in and be the black scorpion. And the black scorpion actually got a win over Brian Pillman, October 14th at the Omni. And, um, there was a famous segment on TV with uh, Gordon Soley in the black scorpion. It started with the black scorpion. Of course, it's Oli's voice saying, bring Gordon in, please. And Gordon comes in and he's been blindfolded and Gordon asks him why the blindfold and the black scorpion says to keep my identity a secret. You and sting are the only ones who've been this close to the black scorpion. So Gordon brings up California and Oli tells him to ask Sting about Tulsa and see what he says. And, um, he says something like, remember sting Sid is after your belt. I'm after your soul. And that's the way they were working towards Halloween havoc. And of course we covered havoc 90 and that's where we would see the black scorpion appear and talk about the black magic. We saw the whole woman being grabbed by the arm and pulled her over to a cart with the curtains around it. And, uh, then the woman, um, well disappears it, and, and then sting is, uh, amazed to see that the black scorpion has reappeared somewhere else. So just some silly magician shit. And there's a a rumor out there that what's the guy's name? Franz Hooray is the person doing the magic tricks and illusions. Yeah. Franz. Yeah. I remember Franz, the magician. (laughs) So Jim Cornette says that Ole Anderson here has essentially started a murder mystery with a body, but no killer. And, uh, we never get an explanation as to where they were really going with it because Both there's not, know. Th- there's not yeah. really a payoff. Um, and is this the biggest m- flop of a storyline in WCW history, in your opinion? Like as far as in WCW main- history, it's gotta be one of them. I don't know if it's the biggest one ever. Big, uh, biggest of this I, era for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this, I think this whole angle kind of just, uh, summarizes the Jim Hurd era. Uh, Hurd wanted something different 
this is what he got, and we could not continue with what Jim Hurd wanted. You know, Jim Hurd was out the door, what, two years later? A year later? Yeah. Rick was not happy about this either. He says, no. uh, to salvage the story, the Scorpion would be exposed as a plot by the horseman to play with Sting's mind. Barry Wyndham would have been great for the part, but he and Arn had a street fight against Butch Reed and Ron Simmons that night. So out of every wrestler in the locker room, I was picked to wear the mask, lose, and have my face revealed. The match was ludicrous and included such timeless moments as the other guys in Scorpion costumes fighting it out with Sting and the referee, Dick the Bruiser, the Crusher's tag team partner during my childhood after the belt. It looked, or after the bell, it looked as ridiculous as it sounds. I had no doubt that Jim Hurd knew exactly what he was doing by putting me in this situation, and I was distraught over it. How ironic that the incident took place in the Keel Auditorium in St. Louis, where some of the NWA's greatest title matches were held back when men who wore the championship belt were treated with deference. Sting was more incensed than I was. He believed the black scorpion angle had ruined his reign and he was right. Um, mm. of course in the match, you can clearly identify Flair's facial features like his nose and his mouth that you were talking about. And if you're listening closely, you can even hear Flair calling some matches. Sure. Um, and you can hear Flair sell too. Like he's selling. You can, you can tell it's his voice, you know, uh, I'm not so sure that I agree with Rick in that this was a, a herd's way of destroying Ric Flair's career. Uh, I, I do agree that this black scorpion thing took a life of its own and kind of encapsulates and represents what the Jim Hurd era was about in WCW. Uh, did it kill sting? Well, no, because if we'll recall sting's biggest run is going to be still to come as the crow, right? Right. So I don't think it killed Sting or well, Sting's title run. It killed this uh, run. I mean, to me, this run is mired with a silly feud with something that there's not going to really be a payoff for. But right, w- what do you think about? Um, I guess this is worth mentioning because, and, and we've covered Great American Bash '91. We, we know that about six months from now, Flair's out of here, and uh, he's gone over a dispute with Jim Hurd. And but prior to leaving. You know, Jim Hurd wanted to put an earring in his ear and make him dress like Spartacus and cut his hair. And Rick actually did cut the hair. I mean, he had right. ridiculous hair and, um, it's gone here now and he never became Spartacus and he refused to wear the earring, but he did cut the hair and he right. wrote, I let Hurd talk me into cutting my hair and I hated myself for it. I didn't think the fans liked it either. I didn't look like Rick Flair. I'd spent all these years putting up with shit, sacrificing my body and never seeing my oldest kids. To find myself manipulated by the whims of a moron, a fucking pizza company executive with his finger on the trigger. Um, Mm. he's right. But let me say this in going back in retrospect and going back and taking a look at Ric Flair and my memories of Ric Flair, when I saw that he had cut his hair, I remember thinking, what the fuck are we doing? But now that I look back on it, it didn't come across to me as so bad. Yeah. Him with a haircut, you know? No, I agree. It seems like something that's been made a big deal of. We should mention that Ric Flair actually won the belt from Sting for his seventh world title uh, at the Meadowlands on January 11th of uh, 1991. And very quickly at the rematch, they make it, they want to make another change because it doesn't do big business. Uh, this time they're in Chicago. They only draw 1,300 fans. And TBS is disappointed. Turner's disappointed and they want to, uh, blame the switch from sting to Ric Flair rather than saying all of this shit killed it. Yeah. Uh, and then of course we know what happens when he refuses to leave. Do you think that this pay-per-view was sort of the nail in the coffin for Flair's WCW run? Hmm. Uh, that, that, that probably, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I would ma- I would say, yes, it was one of the things I've enjoyed over the years. And I was, I was talking to, uh, one of the flair children about the silliness of this match once. And the thing I enjoyed the most about it is it's a cage match and it's the main event and it's for the world title. So flair blades in the match, because that's what you do. If you're in a cage match for the world title on a big pay-per-view, but as he's doing it, 
he's literally wearing a mask and it's black and red. So he's bleeding his ass off here, but only he knows it. Right. Well, you're going to see later on when they, they pull off the mask and have the white mask underneath. Sure. Is when he really starts gigging himself and he's got to gig himself through the mask to where the cuts are now a lot deeper than they normally are. And one of the things, and, and I've talked so much about later on that night at the St. Louis airport Marriott, Ric Flair running through the Marriott naked and Ric Flair wearing the robe and saying, doing his scorpion voice, saying, how can you contend with this and opening up the robe and showing the baby's arm. Ric Flair also was bleeding that night. And he, he had, uh, he had there. Now there you see them. The mask is off and there you see the white mask and Flair has getting ready to cut himself. Flair also had, couldn't stop his cuts from bleeding that night later on. He, and he tried as best he could, but now notice right now that you cannot see the blood, right? Right. But you're going to see it. And he really cut himself that night to the point to where he had trouble uh, stopping the bleeding much later that night. So uh, to me, that's when, when I go back and think about this and remember seeing Rick, uh, afterwards in the St. Louis Marriott, I think about, uh, this is one of my favorite spots of the whole night. Because it's very <laughs> apparent that flair just really wants to crotch himself here and he does. And he falls like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> oh, tremendous. Uh, but anyway, that, that's one of the things I remember thinking about. Boy, Flair is such a pro. Uh, uh, just like you said, a cage match, you got to bleed in a cage match, right? So he's going to bleed, but man, he is going to bleed severely. Right here is where he goes down, starts sawing away. And buddy, the blood, if there was not a mask on, his face would have been a uh -uh, crimson mask. And, and Flair is, is calling the spots here and there's a little bit of miscommunication. This is not their best match ever, but the point is Flair's trying to drive his face into that cage as many times as he can, because he wants to sell the cage in a big way. Right. And, and Flair does a great job getting it over in spite of wearing a mask, which is kind of ridiculous. I mean, I know they do it in Mexico all the time, but, uh, it's a little yeah. ridiculous in America, but here it is. Yeah. So Flair goes down again uh, and again, Flair's trying to get more juice and, uh, it's just one of his, uh, wow. Now he tells Sting, you know, hit me on now. You can see, uh, how much he is bleeding. I mean, it's to the point to where it's like all over the forehead and in his it's, eyes it's, and everywhere in his eyes everywhere. Absolutely. And it's a case of cutting and uh, being in a cage match. He being a pro. And there's the one, two, three, the slowest count ever. what do you think of that finish? Just a cross body yeah. for the pin. It feels a little anticlimactic. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, it does. And combine that with the shitty one, two, three, Dick the bruiser being in St. Louis and being in with Jim hurt, it all kind of fit. So other Didn't black it? scorpions are coming in the ring and Dick, the bruiser, your referee is yeah. uh, interfering. Yeah. In the violence. And he's trying to unmask the black scorpions. And now we're going to see Dave. There's Dave Shelton in the ring. Big guy. Uh, the other guys, I'm not so sure who they are. Uh, but I remember Dave and, uh, and here now the black scorpions trying to leave. He's trying to leave. So sting does not know who he is. Give play sting, by play him. on he's him trying, trying to, leave. to leave here. Yeah. Keep going. Okay. He's trying to leave. And now the, well, wait a minute. He, he's, is he <laughs> look at flair trying to, Jesus Christ, would you get out of the cage? Or Jesus Christ, Sting, would you stop him? Arn Anderson has come in. I might as well get back down and attack Sting again. It's so ridiculous to see Flair yeah. act like he's trying to leave, but then just lay they there. Come back in. Yeah, it's it's all pretty ridiculous. And Flair is bleeding profusely now. They still have to remember this is the mask versus the title. So he must unmask, right? But the horsemen say, uh-uh, we're the horsemen. Fuck that. We do exactly what we want to do. And now it's pretty apparent. And Jim Ross even, even says it. Right around the time here, Jim Ross says, I don't know how much time's left in the show, but I'd love to know. <laughs> Talking right to the truck. Get a chance to go back and listen to this part. It's freaking hilarious. By the way, when I see, I'm going to see JR at the Rose Bowl coming up. And when I see him, I'm going to remind him of this spot. <laughs> By the way, uh, Lord knows I love me some Ric Flair, but how awful are yeah. his chair shots? 
He does not oh, want to hurt anybody. Yeah. Oh, and here's another, uh, here's another thing. If you want to run a wrestling promotion, okay. And you uh, are going to lock the cage and you're going to send some guys down with, uh, bolt cutters, uh, make sure they know how to use the fucking bolt cutters. Okay. Uh, we're going to see that here in just a few minutes. Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, let's see. Have you ever used bolt cutters? No. Okay. There we go. We get it. No. Okay. Uh, let's try it again. Uh, Barry Wyndham, he's, he's a hell of a man. He get his thumb cut off here. You know how to use the bolt cutter? Let's try it again. Uh, uh, don't have it yet. What the fuck? Oh, uh, well, we'll just pull the cage down. Oh, thank God we got it open. <laughs> see, that's one of those little things to where it's just. And of course, clusterfuck. nobody knows how much time is left. And, and right. Ross is yelling, he's got blonde hair, but who is it? Right. Right. Well, it's pretty apparent. It's Ric Flair. And there's the end of our show as Flair walks away bleeding profusely. And they don't show the blood or Flair clearly on camera. Right. Which sort of defeats the point of blading, does it not? It defeats the point of blading and it defeats the point of the uh, stipulation for the match. The great reveal is uh, him running with his head down and the announcer telling you who it is. It should have been just like the Phantom of the Opera's reveal. Okay. But you can also, as you see at the end, we'd like for you to order your merchandise. Uh, Sizes are small, medium, large, or extra large. Unfortunately, there's not a double XL, so I couldn't have gotten one. Uh, but we'd like to also like to wish you happy holidays from your fucked up World Championship Wrestling crew. Well, December sixteenth oh, of nineteen ninety. What What do you think overall of Starcade nineteen ninety? There was a lot going on here. We've got, uh, the tag title tournament, of course, doom and the horseman Luger and Hanson and a, a decent enough Tom Zink, Bobby Eaton match. And then the black scorpion in a cage overall, where would you rank Starcade 90? Uh, do you want me to give it stars? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or, or I, I didn't like it overall. And, and I say that from the, from this point of view. Because I was involved in all that black scorpion clusterfuck and trying to decide what we're going to do next for it and trying to appease Jim Hurd. I didn't like the tag team tournament with the exception of the Steiner brothers. Every time they wrestled, I enjoyed that. I thought Conan was a great performer. I like seeing him overall. The Luger match with uh, Stan Hansen was very good, but overall didn't like the event at all. Uh, with the exception of the guy holding the microphone in the back in the interviews was a pretty guy. With a great mullet. Uh, other than that, no, I didn't like it at all. And, and this is, uh, please don't misunderstand me, anybody. Paulie Dangerously is one of the great talkers ever, and maybe one of the greatest managers ever. But I don't think, uh, compared to some other guys, he was that good of a color guy. Only because I just don't think that that was his niche. So, compared to a Jesse Ventura, you know, you know, or a or a Bobby Heenan or something like that working with JR. You know, we've, uh, we've talked around the story a lot, but I feel like you should give everybody the hotel room story with, right. uh, Ric Flair that night. All right. Uh, Ric Flair calls me, uh, in the, I don't know what time of night it was. And he says, I want you to come up here to my room. And, and I've said, no, I'm not. Uh, and he said, I'm, I want you to come up to my room or I'm going to find you and come down and get you. Now, if I would have thought, I would have thought to myself, well, he has no idea what room I'm in, but then again, he's Ric Flair. He could probably bribe somebody at the front desk if I know what room I'm in. So I said, okay, I'll come up. So, uh, when I went up to his room, the door was ajar. you know how in hotel rooms you can stick the little thing out. Uh, the room was ajar, and he said, come on in. So he had the black scorpion mask on, uh, and he had, uh, he had the, Olivia's robe on and he jerked off the mask and he had st blood was coming down. And he said, look at this, look at this. I said, what? look at what? And he was in front of the, of the closet. And in the Marriott's back in, back then the closet was just, was a big mirror. And he said, sting. How can you contend? He was doing his black scorpion voice. How can you contend with this? And he opened up the robe 
And there was the big baby's arm at full attention. I know he had worked it to where it gotten hard. And if you ever seen Ric Flair's baby's arm hard, you know how incredible of a sight it was. Now, let me tie that into 30, 30 for 30. That story I just told you, okay, was told to the people at ESPN. But they edited the thing in to make it sound like I was on that flight between Puerto Rico and Portland. I was not on that flight. They edited that story in to make it sound like that. You remember that part of it? Yeah. Yeah. So that story I actually told on 30 for 30 was, was that night in the Marriott. So he says, he does it again. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's, and he's so drunk. And this big robe that I guess Olivia made is so heavy. It's pulling him down to where he can't stand up. Hold on, hold on. I'll do it for you again. And he's laughing like hell. Sting, how can you contend with this? And he opens it up and there's the baby's arm again. So I say to him, okay, thank you very much. You stupid fucker. I'm going back to bed. Uh, so now I go back, I don't go to bed, but I go back and I get the phone call again. And this time it's one of his friends. He had his Charlotte contention up there with him. Some of his friends from Charlotte, they call me and they say, have you seen Rick? And I said, yes, I've seen enough Rick for the rest of the night. They said, is he in your room? And I said, no, what are you talking about? I said, well, he is missing. I said, what do you mean he's missing? I say, we're in his room. I don't know who the guy was. We're in his room and he is left his room. And I said, so what? They said, here's the, so what he's fucking naked. I said, so he's running around the St. Louis Marriott naked. They said, yes. I said, I'll be right up. And I, and I did that out of two reasons. Number one, I'm a friend of Rick's. And I don't want him to really get in trouble because I love him. And number two, (laughs) I just kind of don't want to see what was going to happen. So I go up and his friends are in there and Terry Boatwright's in his room as well. Why is Terry Boatwright in his room? Well, according to Terry and I, she's, she and I talked about this. Uh, she was told by Rick, there's going to be a party and come over. She was staying at another hotel and, uh, she had her bag from the, uh, from the uh, arena and she put her bag in Ric Flair's room. She came up to get her bag and then she got drawn up, drawn into all this. And apparently Rick was running around naked in the St. Louis Marriott and every guy would go, I was standing in his room and I would say, okay, you guys go out and look for him and I'll stay in his room. See if he shows up. One guy went out running out. Another guy went out. Nobody could find him to where I finally said, I'm going, I've had enough of this. This is up to you guys. So I go, go to bed. And as the story goes the next day, they finally get Rick to go in his room. But Rick flair was, you know, he had, I guess he had lost a lot of blood and he had drunk a lot. Uh, as the story goes, which is, this is a story that's been very, uh, that he talks about. And we all know now, uh, after everybody has said, okay, Rick, stay in your room. And he said, okay, I will stay in my room. Everybody else goes to bed. Rick decides to get up and go out of his room again. And he does stark naked and the door to his room locks behind him. And we're talking like four o'clock in the morning by this time. So obviously he doesn't have his key on him because he doesn't have a pocket. Uh, and he ends up going down in the elevator <laughs> and sticking his head out of the elevator. And if you know the St. Louis Marriott back then, the elevators were kind of like left of the uh, front desk sticking his head out of the elevator. He goes, psst, psst. I, why he did this? I don't know. I mean, everybody else in the hotel has, has seen the baby's arm by now. Why not show it to the front office or the front desk? And they said, what he said? I need some, I've locked myself out of the room. I need somebody to come up with me to my room and let me in. They said, okay, we'll send a security guard. And they sent a woman security guard. Oh my. And she rides a, she rides up in the elevator with him, stark naked, still drunk, probably still bleeding, and lets him in his room. And that was the end of the St. Louis. That, that was the end of the night the St. Louis Marriott. There was an APB for Ric Flair from his friends, me being one, to try to find him, but nobody could find him. But we knew that he was running around naked in the St. Louis Marriott. So when I tell the story, Sting, how can you contend with this? That was from the St. Louis Marriott and not from the flight, which I was not on that they were talking about. 
in the 30 for 30. So, yes, uh, uh, a lot of people have asked that on 30 for 30, everybody talk about Ric Flair the worker, Ric Flair the drinker, uh, Ric Flair uh, the ladies' man. But, Tony, why did, when they wanted to talk about Rick's penis, why did they come to you first on 30 for 30? And my response is that through the years, unfortunately, not by my own doing, I became a, an expert on Ric Flair's penis. Well, um, you are an expert on Starcade 1990, and this is an angle that only lasted like four months, but, uh, people are still talking about it all this time later, nearly 30 years later. So uh, I had a good time covering this. We're going to be covering Starcade 1991 next. So cruise on over oh, to facebook.com forward slash WHW Monday. And we're going to talk about battle bowl. Let's rapid oh. fire some questions here about 1990 from the fans. Are you ready? Yeah. Is it going to get better? Conrad, is Star going to get better in 91? Please, before I have to watch it again. Justin Guest wants to know, who would you have preferred to have been the Black Scorpion? I would have preferred the Ultimate Warrior. I love you for that. Chris Gallant wants to know, if the computer was the key to Wall Street's success, why didn't the other wrestlers just buy computers? Uh, because uh, they put their money in booze. Uh, Don wants to know any good Muda stories. None. Didn't know him at all. Jacob Sorry. wants to know, was anyone not comfortable working with the 100% legitimate stud Russian wrestlers? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, language barrier and the fact that they were, they were shooting amateur wrestlers scared the shit out of people, uh, of guys, because anybody who's been in wrestling will tell you. And the Steiner brothers were legit amateur wrestlers. Anybody will uh, been in professional wrestling will tell you that legit amateur wrestlers are the scariest ones of all. Uh, Seth wants to know, was there ever any talk of putting the belt on the black scorpion? No, not at all. Brian Benson wants to know why two R's in Starcade? to make it different, to make it a logo. Uh, Brian wants to know why in the heck did Flair beat Sting for the title just two weeks later, not on pay-per-view? Uh, I can't answer that. Um, I Norman, wish I knew why. Norman Smiley is on this pay-per-view. Was Tony a fan of the Big Wiggle? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, not at that time, but as we moved on later on, I thought it was a very, very interesting move. Uh, Bud wants to know... Was there ever any thoughts of putting beautiful Bobby with a new manager once Cornette left the company? Of course, we know dangerously would eventually, but do you remember right after if anybody was thought anybody considered that? No, not, not right after, uh, Scotland wants to know was Sting's run as champion considered a failure by higher management. Uh, we have to do higher management changed uh, so much. Uh, we're talking about this run right here. Yeah. Was this his only run? At this Can't time, yeah, that. at this time. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was considered a failure. Uh, why does Chris Adams not get the credit he deserves for the best super kick in the business? Yeah, that question, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, Chris Adams deserves much, we talked about this earlier in this podcast, deserves much more uh, notoriety and much more uh, respect than he gets in this business. Well, and you guys deserve much more from the audio quality. We're going to go ahead and wrap up this week's episode. Starcade 1991 is next. Mark your calendars. Uh, be sure to watch it before or with us next week. It's Battle Bowl. Uh, lots of interesting stuff on that show. I can't wait to talk about, and we'll see you next week right here on What Happened When Monday on the MLW Radio Network. Tony, looks like it's about that time. Sting pulls off the mask. It's Lois Shivani. Oh my God. And if we know her, she's not selling shit. We'll see you next week on What Happened When on the MLW Radio Network. Welcome to WHW Monday. Tony Shivani and Conrad Thompson. She
Jim Crockett, First Arcade, 605 NWA, TV title, Cajun Omni, The Bunkhouse Stampede, Flair and Horseman, Garvin, Bogey, Magnum, Dusty, Express Tag, Turner, Bond, and Mid-South Joint World Championship Wrestling. Talking about the great years of World Championship Wrestling, the NWA and Jim Crockett Promotions. Tony and Friends North, they win, look, Shivani's back again, World Title Split Off, Center Stage, Bischoff, Disney, Hogan, and Nitro, New World Order, and The Crow. Thunder Russo, Arquette Champ, Vinny Mac, Simulcast. Tony's back with Conrad, not your classy podcast. Watch along, try not to laugh, lowest rules, cat back. This wasn't the initial plan, Tom Ziggs a good looking man. Quanda 